a few slides anyway. Yeah. Go. Yeah. I've got a few slides anyway, but I thought I'll start with this one first. And then after that, go into the details of, of the deal. Cool. Because as you know, like in our rooms or in your room, should I say, you've got all different types of individuals. You've got some like high end, some normal, and you've got some, a lot of beginners in there. So I just thought, try and help out some of the beginners, give them some guidance. Because sometimes you get a lot of messages via Clubhouse or via Instagram or Facebook. And they're asking you that simple or like basic questions. So I thought, just do a simple one today, <clears throat> just so people can understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jake, our room, you was right the first time, definitely our room. Um, and yeah, that, <laughs> and I say that all the time, you never know, so to cover the basics and it would like, even I like hearing the basic stuff. So even the more advanced will like hearing that. And tell the guys what you said about how you was going to stagger this in regards to rather, rather than saving all the Q&A, you were taking a flat pause, right? Tell the guys about that. Yeah. Um, what the, why outside London? No, no, you said just now, like normally you hold the Q&As to the end, but you said what you'll do is you'll take a pause after Doncaster, and if anybody oh, yeah. wants to ask some questions, then they can. Yeah, yeah, that's fine, yeah. So basically what I'm going to do is two different um, scenarios. One of them we were buying inside Doncaster, and the other one we were buying inside or oh, Enfield. And after the Doncaster one, because there's quite a bit that's gone into it, um, I'll stop after the Doncaster one, and then people can just ask questions or share their views and so forth. And then after that, I can move on to the end for one straight after. All right. So, all right. So good evening, everyone. This is like a basic um, presentation on buying in Enfield and buying in Doncaster as well. So just in case, if you don't know me, my name is Jason Patterson. So the best thing to do um, is to start off with, <clears throat> in this case, it is why you're getting into property. So a lot of people might go into it maybe to because they want to quit their job or because they want to put some money towards their pension or some people might want a backup income um, alongside their day job because sometimes a lot of people get made redundant or been put on furlough because of COVID and they want some income coming in on the side just to be safe. But some, some people might just want to part their cash um, because they're getting their money from another job or another business some people just want to be financially free. Um, there's all different reasons. Some people just want to get into it as to diversify their portfolio. They might want to go along their crypto or their stocks and shares alongside their business just to mix it up a little bit. And then there's some people, for example, that just want to do it just to buy some property abroad or just to buy a property themselves, a residential. So there's all different types of reasons why people get into property. But your why determines what type of strategy that you want to move forward with. So today, you're just going to be talking about maybe the buy sell let strategy um, rather than the BRR or the short leases or the flips and, and, and that kind of thing. So <clears throat> some people might want to target or have a goal or some forth. So some might be 2,000 a month, some might be 5,000 a month, some might be 10,000 a month. It all depends. So once, I don't know, you, you saw out some sort of why or aim, then you write down some sort of goals and targets towards, towards that as well. These slides here, I'm just gonna brush through and then just to get to the main, main section. So the property strategies that are involved, there's loads of them. Some of them are on the screen. You've got like a normal buy to let, um, simple vanilla buy to lets where you buy the property and rent it out. You've got HMOs where you do room lets. You've also got the, the BRR strategy where you buy, refurb, refinance, and then rent it out afterwards. Some people also do flips. Some also do commercial to residential. Some do service accommodation. Some do rent to rent. Some do assisted living. Like, there's so many different ways of doing it. But today, we're just going to focus mainly on um, just the buy to lets, which is just some of the examples of what sort of property strategies you can use going forward. <clears throat> now, the types of mortgages that are available to most people um, are residential and then there's commercial. So with residential, you can either do a repayment where you're paying off the capital and the interest. There's some way you're paying off just the interest only, which is what a lot of buy to let people do. Or you can do part payment and part interest. So you can mix it a little bit, where it's like 70-30 or 30-70, all depends. 
I mean, there's also like a commercial mortgage as well. But that's to do with like commercial properties, like shops and, and that kind of thing. All right, the ways to measure a deal. So in general, we can measure it by doing, finding the yields, return on investment, or return on capital employed, and also return on well, capital appreciation, basically. That's uplifting value. When you either sell it or flip it or extend the lease, it creates an uplifting value. Then there's so many different ways of making money from it. As I mentioned one or two before, um, you've got rental income, you've got capital appreciation, you can carry out a refurb, you can remortgage, um, you can get a second loan on it, you can extend the lease. There's so many different ways that you can make money from it. But today we're just going to be focusing mainly on the rental income side of it rather than any of the others. Now, <clears throat> when you purchase a property, there's different ways you can do it. You can do it under your own personal name if you want to, under a limited company. You can buy it under a trust, do partnership, use an LLP. Um, also do joint ventures, which is like Damien's speciality. There's all, all different ways. But today, um, we're going to be just doing it under the person's name or under my name, for example. Just straightforward vanilla buy to let. So there's a lot of exit strategies. I just put some on the screen because um, some people say, oh, you got all these properties or when you purchase in the future, what other ways can you exit? So <clears throat> there's some different, like, different ways of doing it. For example, what they do, some people put up a nice portfolio and then after that, they, use, they might sell a handful of them and then those handful pay off for the rest of them. Um, some people, they just stop buying I and mean, instead of using that deposit money for future purchases, they use that deposit money to pay off their outstanding mortgages. So they're going to be mortgage free eventually. Um, sometimes what people do is transfer the properties into other people's names once they're paid off for. Um, there's all different ways of doing it. That's just an example or a list of some of the ways that you can exit in the future. All right. So whenever you're looking to get a mortgage, the main things that you're going to need or well, the first thing you should do really is to, uh, yeah, is to, um, where's it gone back? Where's it gone back? It's gone back. What you should do is go to a mortgage broker first. And then they, should, they can give you an idea of what needs to be, well, basically what you can lend. So on average, you might need about three months to six months worth of wage slips. Um, if you're self-employed, you might need a tax self-assessment form, which is called the SA302. On average, you might need about two years worth in order to move forward. Um, if you're buying through a limited company, on average, again, it's a minimum of maybe what, two years worth of company accounts. Um, you need a copy of your credit report, definitely, to see if there's any blemishes, missed payments, late payments, any CCJs, all that kind of thing. And your credit has to be, if possible, excellent, but you can get mortgages if you have average or good credit as well. And you also want to need proof of address, um, bank statements, so I said passports, driving license, all of these kind of things in order for you to at least apply for a mortgage. <clears throat> all right, so let's move over to the main slide now, which is about purchasing a property in Doncaster. Let me just get this one up. This one here. All right, I'm gonna move everyone to the side. Yeah. Okay, so this particular example is from one of my um, mentees. They're buying a three bedroom house in Doncaster. <clears throat> so first of all, you get, or you get asked, oh, why did you choose Doncaster? So we looked at different places, looked at, um, for example, Liverpool, went to Darlington and also Doncaster, done a bit of research. And one of the main reasons why we chose there is because of the return on investment and the ROI for short. And also, there's also a possibility of capital appreciation. And we looked at the distance from London as well. It's, it's kind of a bit further out, but we just thought we'd go anyway. <laughs> All right, so when you're looking outside London, on average, it's also good to maybe try and get an ROI of between 15 and about 20% outside London. 
like I said, we looked at Doncaster, looked at Liverpool, looked at um, Darlington as well. And but in terms of prices and the ROI, Doncaster seemed more more feasible and potentially has a good maybe option of capital appreciation going forward. But pre-COVID, we went up there pre-COVID and some of the properties are three-bed houses, for example, were going for like 60 or 55, 60, 60 60-ish. And then after COVID now, or not after COVID, but after lockdown one, two, and three, gone back up there and they've risen even more. So it's hard to get them kind of cheaper properties up there anymore, but prices are creeping up bit by bit. So on average, maybe in the space of about maybe two years, two years, three years, they've gone up by about maybe 15, 20 grand overall. So at least there's a bit of capital appreciation up in Doncaster anyway. All right, <clears throat> so to start with, how did you find this property? So basically, um, we started searching on, on Rightmove. But like, I prefer Rightmove rather than Zoopla, but Zoopla is still fine as well. And then, um, we looked at places where they're close to train stations, close to local amenities as well. Um, say within about a mile or a mile and a half from a train station is good and not too far from the shops, like supermarkets and, and that kind of thing. Also set up alerts on, on right move. So if anything new comes onto the market, then right move should alert you and let you know that yep, there's something that's common because in this game, if you snooze, you lose. So you have to be in there quite sharp, otherwise that property is going to go. Because properties will get snapped up like left, right and centre. You get a booking, you say, yep, we've booked it in for, for Friday or, or for next Monday. And by the time Friday or Monday comes, that property is gone. So with this game, you have to be fast. If you're not fast, then, then you lose out. Also phoned up a few agents, um, like I said, and set up a few viewings. Um, and we also asked the agents what co what postcodes are good or bad for Doncaster. Because obviously some areas in, in most towns, you've got good areas and you have bad areas. And then we asked around well, quite a few different agents. So then we got a general consensus of what the best postcodes are in, in Doncaster. And also in Doncaster as well, it's also got floodplains. Now, sometimes um, you get these periods where there's heavy rainfall. Now, um, now and again, areas do get flooded. So if you see a property that's near a river, within probably, I'm not sure the exact radius of it, but if it's not too far from a river, then personally, I wouldn't buy it because now and again, those rivers can burst their banks. I mean, those properties in the surrounding like, radius can be flooded. I mean, that's going to be a nightmare in terms of insurance. So when you're looking on the map, of these particular properties, look to see if there's any rivers close by. And if there's any rivers close by, then that's a no-no from me. <clears throat> All right, so this one is the picture of the three bedroom house. Um, it's in good condition. Like everything's basically been done. Um, so three beds, you've got two double bedrooms and a box room. Um, bathroom's nice. All the rooms are nice. Kitchen's decent condition as well. Um, the guard is not too bad. It's all magnolia, everyone's favorite color for rental properties. So it's decent. Now this one, put down a 25% deposit. So the purchase price is 78,000. So you put down 25% deposit, which is 19,500. Now this particular person, this is their first purchase. So with the first purchase, even though it's a buy to let and they don't own any residential property, um, the solicitor said that there's going to be zero stamp duty to pay because this is the first time, this is the first time buyer. If it wasn't a first time buyer, then you would have to pay 2,340 um, stamp duty. The survey for this one, the survey fee was 123 pounds. Um, the broker fee is roughly about 400 pound-ish. All the solicitor's fees, roughly, it's going to be about 1,500. So all in to buy this particular property is roughly about 21,500. Yeah, so 21,500 with a buy-in, that's for Doncaster. 
Now, the rental income for this particular property is 525. When we're up there, obviously agents will say, yeah, we can get a fee for 550, like rental income per month or 575 or whatever it may be. So what we've done um, along that road, there were a couple that were available to rent. So we phoned up the agents and said, oh, that um, we're prospective tenants and we're looking to rent a property along this road. Um, how much rental income is that um, obviously do we need for this particular property? So they came back with about 550, a lot of them. So um, we're just going to make it at 525 just to make it more, more conservative, just in case. But it probably will be 550 because it's a free bed house. Then this particular agent that we're going with, they're going to charge 9.5% um, agency fee, which is roughly about £50 per month. The mortgage is £103 a month. So if you take away the agency fee and the mortgage, from the rental income, then this particular property is roughly going to be about £372 profit per month. All right, so with these, we can work out yields, uh, return on investments, and, and so forth. So to work out the yield of this particular property, you always do the annual rent, yep, which is 525 and you times that by 12. So 525 times by 12, that gives you 6,300. Then you divide that by the purchase price, which is 78,000. So this particular yield works out to about 8.08%. So with yields, I don't really use yields myself, but this is like a good overview to see how much of a return you can get for this particular property. I work more on either return on investment or return on capital employed, which is R-O-C-E. But the next calculation down here relates to return on investment, which is called ROI. So this is the annual profit divided by all of the cash that you've in initially invested. So the profit, this particular one, is £372. So you times it by 12, which is like 4,464. And then you divide it by your initial investment that you put into it. So from the previous slides, it's roughly about 21,500 that's, that's gone into it. Then you times it by 100 and it works out an ROI of about 20.7%. So which fits within the targets. Cause you're always looking between what, 15 and 20% ROI. So this one fits in there perfectly. And that, what that means in plain English is within about five to six years, if there's no, nothing major that goes wrong with it, then you should get all of your initial money back. Yeah, so 20.7% ROI, which is not too bad for this particular property. So before it's being let, you're going to need to have um, obviously a gas safety cert, an electric cert, um, any refurb costs and blah, blah. But with this one, there's no refurb costs because everything's been done basically. So it's just going to be needed to get done. Um, gas safety and electric cert and the EPC is quite high as well. So C, so that's fine. Now, the bottom part of it, which says ROCE, is basically if you wanted to work out all of your, basically your return on capital employed, but sometimes you have to do refurb costs, we might have to extend the lease, we might have to do this or that. Yeah, um, you can use that to get an accurate figure um, of the money that you've been put into the business or put into the property, basically. But this particular property doesn't need any work doing to it. So the ROCE, um, I've calculated for this one. But 20.7% is, is a decent amount for this particular property. Now, <clears throat> it's like a stretched out version of the mortgage offer. Um, this is with NatWest. So the loan amount is 58,500. So put down 25% deposit and it's 75% loan to value. They call it LTV, loan to value. So NatWest is going to loan 58,500 to get this property like, let out. Now, these ones are a bit blurred. <clears throat> Let me just move this down out of the way. Yeah. All right. So, is it pause? Unpause. This always happens, you know that. 
let me go back into it again. So, one minute, one minute. All right, yeah. So this particular property is coming up now. Let me minimize this. Can you see the screen? Yes, buddy. Yep. All right. I'm mean, it's coming up as paused. All right. So um, this is the second page of the mortgage offer. Um, Hang on, mate. No, we can't. Oh, it's can't. gone now. <laughs> All right. One sec. One sec. One sec. Can you share your screen? Then go again. Yeah, I want to share this one, and then I will reshare. Mm -hmm. all right yeah yeah come back yeah all right so now we see the second page of the mortgage offer um obviously it's got all the small print and so forth um offer of the loan it's got conditions of the offer etc etc now this particular one um was issued on the 8th of october 2021 and this mortgage offer lasts for six months so you've got six months to complete on this particular deal. And I'm just zooming on it. <clears throat> so that is in the first section. It tells you when the offer was issued. And then it says offer of loan. And then in the second section down here, it says this offer is valid until the 8th of April, 2022. So effectively you've got roughly about six months to complete on this particular property. But in general, within about maybe another eight weeks or six weeks, um, it should be in the bag anyway. But you've got ample time just to get this, this deal over the line. Now, with this particular one, this interest rate is 2.13%. Um, it's fixed for five years, interest only. Yeah, interest only buy to let mortgage. And as you can see at the bottom, well, the survey fee is roughly about £123, which is the valuation fee. So the bank will send someone out and value the property, make sure it's worth what the offer is and that kind of thing. So yeah, so it's 2.13% um, fixed for five years, interest only mortgage. So I'll zoom in with that one. <clears throat> this particular one, um, you have to pay another admin fee of £75, um, which is payable when you make a mortgage application. They're going to charge you £30 for the chaps bank bank transfer and everything. But yeah, valuation fee for this one's not too bad. So one, one two, three is how much NatWest are charging. All right. So 2.1%, 2.3% fixed for five years. Now, with this particular one, um, sometimes I like to calculate it myself just to make sure, obviously, the bank's got it right. So it's 58500 I And mean, if the rate is 2.13%, I always do the percentage, which is 2.13. I divide that by 100, which gives me the multiplier. That's why up here you've got um, 58500 times 0 0.0213. I and mean, then that gives you the annual amount of mortgage payments that you have to pay. And then when you divide that by 12, then that gives you how much your mortgage is per month. So when you round it, it's 103 pounds and 84 pence. So that's what the mortgage will be on this particular property. All right, in section five, yep, yeah, that's just a zoomed in version of it. Um, the second part of it, where it says 347 payments, the available rate of 4.09%, if after the five years, Huh? Yeah. If after the five years you don't wish to exchange deals over, then you'll be paying 199.67. But obviously, at the end of that mortgage deal, you'll be looking for another lender and you change companies or you do a product switch with that particular company. So, yeah, it's best just to do that before the five years is up. But yeah, this one is a 34 year buy to let mortgage. That's what NatWest were offering. But all sorts of different like deals on the table, but this one 
is probably more cheapest or more yeah more cheaper over that period of time so a 34 year buys to let mortgage at 103 pounds 84 pence per month now <clears throat> further down in the mortgage document um, you can make overpayments if you want to of roughly about 10 percent per year um, without any penalties and you can also make regular overpayments as well monthly overpayments if you want to but again the maximum you can overpay on your mortgage per year is 10 percent otherwise they're going to penalize you so if you pay over 10 percent then there's going to be charges that you, you're, you're going to have to pay towards um, that west because obviously they want to make their money out of it and then at the bottom of the screen it's got additional secured borrowing now because some people will say oh if you're if the property goes up in value over that five-year period then if you want to scale and take some money out of it really you don't want to be locked in for five years because sometimes you might want to take out money that, that that capital appreciation and then use that money plus your savings to go and buy another one <clears throat> so at the bottom of this deal it's got down additional secured borrowing so these are the terms of their additional secured borrowing so you don't you, don't need to remortgage halfway through or pull out of a deal before the five years is up. You can draw down from this particular property as well. So when you zoom in with that one, um, it says they, they got that specific rules or NatWest have anyway. So it says basically that you can apply for extra borrowing at any time, but they got conditions. So it says, please note that if you're applying for additional borrowing on this buy to let mortgage, we may not be able to lend um, to you further money on it on this contact if you have over nine properties or more all right so if you've got nine properties or more then because of their policy they will not lend you any money on this particular property but this person has less than nine so it's fine so if it goes up next year or in six months or in two years time and that person wants to take out 20 grand or 15 grand or 30 grand wherever it may be they can do that so, and then use that cash to go and buy more property afterwards. So if you're doing, if you're looking to scale basically, then look for a mortgage deal where you can extract the cash. So you can obviously use that plus any savings you have, plus any other rental income, plus any, any other employed income. I mean, you can use that towards your next deposit. So even though it's a five-year fixed, you're still allowed to do drawdowns of this particular deal, which is a, which is a good thing. If that wasn't there, then that particular deal, we, we wouldn't have been choosing. All right, so some of the solicitor's fees or solicitor's costs are here. So the basic solicitor's cost or purchase is about 650, I think it is roughly. Yeah, that's, oh, so 850, 850 for this one. And then you've got all these little fees involved, um, which obviously you've got to pay the solicitor towards, and then it puts it towards the final balance and so forth. Um, so about the basic, basic solicitor's fees, which will vary from from solicitor to solicitor. This one's about 1,180, and then there's always some add-ons that you have to do. And then like I said, the stamp duty for this one is nil because um, this is the, the person's first property what they're buying. So even though it's a buy to let, um, they still qualify for nil stamp duty. Otherwise it would have been, I think 2,000 and something. But yeah, it's always factoring roughly about 1,500 for solicitor's fee, just in case, because always little things that they so add on to the bill, um, the searches and insurance and so forth. Yeah, <clears throat> so if, for example, someone wanted to go and find out how much it costs in terms of stamp duty, um, this website is good. It's called stampdutycalculator.org.uk. Um, you can type in, if you're a first time buyer, if you're moving home, if you're an additional buyer, put in the purchase price of the property, press calculate and then it comes up with the amount of stamp duty that you're going to be paying on this particular purchase of that property so that's a good little tool that you can use if you're going forward in terms of residential or a buy to let property now if you're buying in Doncaster or anywhere up north South Yorkshire West Yorkshire Manchester then um, Sandy, who's on the clubhouse as well, 
she's she's got a good connection up there or a good connection to know um she can find you tenants she's got a good set of tradespeople, plumbers electricians um chippies any tradespeople you want if it's in yorkshire and manchester and or manchester she's a per good person to contact because a lot of the time people say yeah i'm gonna buy this property outside but I don't know anyone up there to help me with it and this and that, but she is a good contact to have. So if you're looking to buy up in Yorkshire or Manchester, then contact her websites there, Bruce and, and Simpsons, Simpsons, should I say, .co.uk. <clears throat> also, another thing, when you're buying outside, sometimes you say, oh, I don't know any builders, any electricians, any plumbers, all that kind of thing. These sites are a good starting point where you can maybe find some tradespeople who can help you along your journey. And what I would also do is probably ask the agent because sometimes the agents also have a lot of local tradespeople that they know and feed business to. So you can either use the internet or ask the current agent because they know, should know a lot of people locally as well in that particular area. I mean, after that, it's just trial and error. Sometimes it might be good, sometimes it might be bad. But you got just, just got to test them out and then see what works and who doesn't work. All right, so this one, obviously, Damon, Ricky, Nick, all of them guys do a lot of training, um, especially with um, Damon's and Ricky's Monday sessions and their master classes and so forth. Um, if you want anything to do with these kind of properties, then you can contact, obviously, Damon, Ricky. They do a lot of sessions um, just to talk them up. Or if you need any help with the vanilla buy to lets or BRRs in Doncaster or short leases, then my details are there on the screen. So you can also access myself or them for some extra help in terms of moving forward on your journey. All right, so that's the Doncaster one out of the way. So what I thought, so let me go on to the other one straight away. We might as well just answer or ask and answer some questions or discuss this one first before we move on to the North London property. That was great, Jay. That was fantastic. Yeah, I've jotted down a few, but I see that Rem threw one in there. So let's go to Remy first. And um, and hi, Remy, lots of investors. All right, Ant's responded to Remy as well. So let's do Remy's question first, although Ant has, has chimed in there. Thanks for that, Ant. Um, and then if any of you guys have, have got a question for Jay, just, just flick your mic off and ask away. Rem, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Jason. That was brilliant. Um, just uh, when you was going through some of the stuff you talked about, um, uh, interest only mortgage for this buy to let. Can you explain why that was um, the best option uh, for you for this purchase or for your uh, mentee's purchase, please? Yeah, for if you're a property investor, um, the main aim is not to pay off your mortgage. Your main aim initially is for cash flow. Then also you can get capital appreciation. That's like a byproduct of it. But this person looking to quit their job, so they want to get as many properties, cash flowing properties as possible um, to basically replace the income. So when you're doing an interest only mortgage, it's, it creates more cash flow. And then for tax purposes, obviously with section 24, you can't claim all of it. But if you're a lower rate taxpayer, then you can claim at least 20% of that um, interest on your mortgage towards your um, like tax bill. But it's more about cash flow rather than repayment because the aim is not to, to pay off. The aim is to create cash flow per month. Um, so that's why interest only was chosen rather than capital and repayment. Brilliant. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, you're welcome. Jay, can I add to that real quick? Yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Rem, so what Jay's talking with the tax, I mean, right now, because of the, the, the new situation with the, the, the mortgage relief and whatever else, and, and I can run through that with you another time and we can do a room on it, right? It's 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 more difficult in your personal name. But if we use limited company, for an example, where the mortgage relief is not, not, a, not, not an issue, if you imagine that you're receiving a thousand pounds in rent every month, but you're paying 500 pounds a month in interest, then you're making 500 pounds a month profit, right? So that goes in your pocket. Um, if, if it's not it's not taxable, the, 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 the 500 pound is tax deductible and the 500 pound isn't, right? Um, do you understand what I mean? I explain, I explain that right. 
you get a thousand pound in rent, you spend a 500 pound on mortgage. Because that 500 pound is tax deductible, you've only made 500 pounds in profit. So you just pay your tax on the 500 pound profit, right? If you do a repayment mortgage, then your payment, I don't know what the figure is, but let's say it jumps from 500 pounds a month to 750. Now you're only making 250, right? Because your rent's a thousand and your repayment mortgage is 750. You'll still get taxed on 500 because the government won't see that 250 of a loan being repaid as an expense. So whatever your tax would be on 500 pounds on a limited company, say 20 percent, um, I don't know, 100 pound, it would still be that same 100 pound. That's one thing to bear in mind, right? It's, it's preference. So what do you prefer? Do you, would you rather have what Jason just said right there, um, the extra money in your pocket every month? Or would you rather pay down your mortgage? Right. That's a preference in individual, you know, each individual person's own choice. But a lot of the time, especially when buying down south, you don't even have the choice because when you're buying these buy to let properties, the lender uses a rent calculation. So the lender wants to see that your rent payment is a certain percentage over and above your mortgage payment. Now, in the limit, as a ballpark, right, as a, as a general guide, when buying in a limited company, that rent calc is worked out on 125%. When buying your personal name, that rent calc is worked out on 150%. So, for example, if your if your mortgage payment was a thousand pounds a month and that lender wanted to see a rent calculation of one hundred and fifty times, they want to see a rent of fifteen hundred right on a thousand pounds a month. If it's one hundred and twenty five, they want to see twelve fifty on a thousand pounds a month. That's if it's interest only and it's a thousand pounds a month. Imagine if it was repayment. Now they want to see 150 times the repayment figure every month. So you have to bear that in. Some deals just won't stack up on a repayment, even if you wanted them to be a repayment. But like Jason pointed out to you there, you can pay off on most mortgages up to 10% a year without being penalized. So that 10% a year, depending on the size of the loan, is, is generally quite a large amount of money. Um, and I would say to anybody that wants to do a repayment mortgage, just take an interest only to make sure, like all my mortgages, you know, Rem, are all interest only, but all my, all my buy to lets. Take an interest only mortgage. And if you feel that you've got a bit of surplus cash and you want to pay off some of your mortgage to get that loan down so that it's paid off by the time you get to the end of the 25 years or whatever it might be, then just pay your 10% a year. It means a bit more headache because you're going to have to like phone. They won't take it on a direct debit. You have to phone up the, or most of them won't, right? It's never like a definite, most of them won't. They won't take it on a direct debit. You have to phone up and make manual payments every month. And that can be a bit of a headache, but it's, it's probably a safer way to do it. Did that make sense, Rem? 100%. That was really useful. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, John's put in there. Um, Jay, can you see that? Wait, in the chats? Yeah, do you know what? I think if you just, just clarifying the ROI and the ROC is the, is, is the same in Doncaster by to let 20.7% return on cash. Oh, yeah. So the, the, RO, the, oh, the ROI for this one, uh, let me move this out of the way, is basically what I've calculated it here. Is the profit, which is obviously seven hundred, well, three hundred seventy-two pounds a month, times that by twelve. Yeah, that's the annual profit, and when you divide it by your initial expenses, that gives you the the ROI. Now, um, in terms of the ROCE, that might not be the same as the ROI because you're gonna have to pay for things like the gas safety. The electric cert, you might want to do a refurb cost, you might have to buy some white goods, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So if you're going to work out your return on capital employed, which is going to be different to the ROI. So you then you include all of those things um, as part of your expenses, and then you do um, a new calculation. But the RO ROCE is different to the return on interest or investment, should I say? <laughs> But for this one, there is no work that needed to be done to it. Um, basically, I didn't bother working at the ROCE. But uh, most people, most investors, or the ones who are probably a bit more professional, they use ROCE to find out how much return they're getting on the actual money that they've inputted into the business. So, yeah, that's basically the difference between the two. 
You know what, as well, Jay, me and you had that conversation yeah. in our room before, didn't we? And, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. and <laughs> me, me and Jay use different terminologies. Like, you know, these, these terminologies are not just used in property, by the way. They're used in, in all different types of investment, and people have different ways of, of using them. So <laughs> what um, uh, John might be referring to there, like, when you use ROI, return on investment, um, I, I think I use that for what you use ROCE for. So I would do yield the same as you. I would do yield being the rent against the purchase price. Mm. Then return on investment to me would be how much rent I get compared to the total money spent. So purchase price, stamp, fees, works, right? So I think that's your ROCE maybe. And then yeah. my, I don't use ROCE, I'll use ROC return on capital would be what your return on investment is. My return on capital would be what return am I getting as per how much money I've left in the deal. So John might be thinking along the same lines of that maybe. Um, mm. As long as you guys understand the formula that Jason, the formula that Jason just laid out there, um, then you can go. And I, I say that all the time. Don't worry too much about the answer. Worry about understanding the formula. If you understand the formulas that Jason's just shared with us, then you'll be able to work these out across all of your deals. Because they're, they're just, and, and the way you've you, you, you've um, listed them out, Jay, the way that you've done them and broken them down, I think it's super useful for people. And a twenty point seven percent return, however you want to word that, whether that's return on investment or return on capital, twenty point seven percent return is great. And again, broken down even further for you out there. Look, five to six years, you get all your money back. So. Um, there's another question and that might relate to that, Joe, if you want to hit that one. Um, oh, yeah. How there's one, I pull that one? Yeah, there's one about, um, what is it? Yeah, there's John's one. I mean, there's another one that says, do you advise buying in your name or a limited company? Now, that all depends on your personal situation because like, for me, um, most of mine, all, all of mine basically are under my own personal name. But that's because um, when George Osborne changed the rules in 2015, um, by that time, I think I might have had, I don't even know, 18, 19 properties by then. And then we sat down that, with my advisor and he went through all of the figures and, and simulation and so forth. And he said, it's probably based on what I want to do with the money. He said, it's probably best to keep them in my own name. But um, if someone else maybe is just starting out or they want to build a portfolio, then it may be better to buy it for a limited company like for tax purposes. Because um, that way, obviously, you're paying less tax. At the moment, it's like 19%. If you earn under, I think it's under 250000 that's what Chancellor said. I mean, if you earn under that amount, I think it's 250000 I can't remember. But um, if it's over that, then I think you've got to pay like 25% tax, which is corporation tax. But if you're going to leave the money in the company and grow your portfolio and not really use it for your day-to-day -day living, then it's fine. Um, you can also take out, I think, the first £2,000 of your dividends from the company into your personal bank account for free. And then after that, you've got to pay dividend tax on your SA302. So if you're a basic rate taxpayer, then you've got to, put, then you've got to pay 7.5% dividend tax. If you're an, um, a higher rate taxpayer, you've got to pay 32.5% dividend tax. And if you're an additional rate taxpayer, then you've got to pay 37.5% dividend tax. So if you're extracting money from the company, then um, you could be taxed, well, quite heavily, depending on what tax bracket you're in at the moment. It all depends if you're employed, um, if you've got business income on the side, um, all these other little factors come into it. So if there's no one size fits all, whether you're buying your personal name or whether you buy for a limited company, but it's best to sit down with a, with a tax advisor or maybe your accountant. I mean, each individual case is, is different. I mean, you can decide whether to buy in your personal name or for a limited company based on what you want to do with that income. But um, the reason why I left it in my personal name is because because earning like, all this money, but just to leave it in the company and not really extract it, then I thought there's it's no point for me because I want to use it. I want to spend it. But um, if you want to build up until a certain point and then maybe draw down on it bit by bit by bit or get your missus or your husband to, to be a part of the business and use their tax allowance as well, then you can do that as well. There's all different ways of doing it. But um, it depends on your personal circumstances, whether to buy in a limited company or, or not. 
and then we've also got another one here actually. It says, "Why is the term?" So, so let long? me add to that one before you before you go any further, just real quick because yeah, you made some on. great points. There. I just want to make sure that like, I highlight one point because I've done the same thing as you, right? I, I bought all my problems in my personal name. My accountant advised me to switch to limited company. The the, the benefit from a tax perspective was not worked out um, as great as what it was supposed to, right? So when when they when they started changing the rules a few years ago and they said like if, if you owning properties in your personal name, basically the tax that you're going to pay is higher. They're not going to allow you to use 100% of the mortgage payment as a tax deductible expense. And what that basically means is, is you're going to be paying more tax, right? So I kind of jumped ship. So did a lot of people started buying limited companies um, to save money, to be able to use all of my mortgage payment as an expense. Like if my, if my rent is a thousand pounds and my mortgage payment is 500 pounds, I want to be able to say that that 500 pounds is an expense. And my only profit is the other 500 pounds. A thousand pounds in rent minus a five hundred pound mortgage payment means I've only made five hundred pounds. But if they're not going to recognise, if HMRC, if the government, if the tax man are not going to recognise that five hundred pounds mortgage payment as an expense, and they're going to tax me on more like than, than the five hundred pound profit, then I'm not happy with that. I'm going to go limited company. But what's happened now is is that the rate that I pay to borrow money through a limited company is much higher than what Jason will pay, and it tends to be around one percent. So Jason might be getting these kind of rates at 2% in his personal name. Or not now, though, because he's a professional landlord. But matey here, his mentee can get 2%, 2.1%. I'm not getting a loan of 3.5. Like, I'm getting free and above because I'm buying in a limited company. So although it makes sense from a tax perspective, I'm saving money with my left hand. On my right hand, I'm paying more in interest at a bank. And when you put master Excel spreadsheet, it's much of a muchness. Saying that, though, I will still buy mainly in a limited company now for two main reasons. One is because, like I said to you, the rental calc stacks up so much better. In a limited company, the lender is generally only looking for 125 times the, the mortgage payment rather than 150 times. And when buying down south, it makes it so much easier to stack my deals on a BRRR. Right, on a BRRR, this is not a BRRR that Jason thought, this is a buy to let, right? I'm putting all my money back, you know, as much of it as possible. I'm maxing out my loan. I'm going highly geared to get my money back. That means my payments are going to be higher. So therefore, the lender is going to be expecting a higher rent. That doesn't always work out, right, on 150 times. But on 125 times, it does. I know that might go over. Some people said you need to hear it a few times and we can cover more of this in the rooms, right? That's one reason. And the second one is, is Jay just hit the nail on the head, Dave. What do you want to do with that money? What's your plan? Like, how much are you earning right now? If you're already a high rate, like you might be in a situation where you say, I don't want to earn no more money. I'm earning 150 grand a year because I'm a dentist or whatever you guys do. I'm paid X amount of tax on that hundred. I don't want to pay. Like, keep that money. Keep it away from me. I want to make it, but I don't want to take it, right? So what do you want to do? Keep a limited company. Buy a limited company. Let that, because when you buy a limited company, you don't own the property. The limited company owns the property. When my limited company buys a property, I'm not the owner. The limited company is the owner. I have to go down as the guarantor. I have to underwrite it to say that if for whatever reason my limited company don't keep up payments, I'm going to make them. But the limited company is the owner. The limited company, the rent is theirs. Keep it in the limited company. Why, if I don't want it because I don't want to pay tax on it, leave it in the limited company, let it build up, then let that limited company buy another property. But then the reverse to that is maybe like maybe that, that Jason's helping out here. He's maintained this book in Doncaster. He's like, no, I want the money. Why? Because I want to give up my job. I want to get, I'm earning three grand a month now doing whatever I'm doing. I want to replace that three grand. So I want to do, if he's earning 300 pounds out of this deal, he wants Jason to find him 10 of them. I want 10 of these at 300 pounds a month. And then that's going to be the free. I want it going into money. Maybe once he gets to that three grand a month, then he'll say, fine, let me jump ship and go to the limited company and start stacking the money up in there. His circumstances might change. But to begin with, that's the situation. Other than one thing that I'll say is that Jason right now is not getting them 2% no more. Jay, you're not because you're a professional landlord. Now you've got over like half a dozen properties or whatever it is. You're paying them high rates like me, right? Exactly. So that's well, what I was saying there, guys. When I'm saying like this guy's paying 2% and in a limited company, I pay a whole percent more. That's only applicable whilst you're not a professional investor, whilst the lenders don't see you as a professional investor. And that's up to a certain amount of, it's about six, yeah, isn't it? Five or six? Yeah, yeah, about that, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So when you get to five or six, like right now, like, and that's why anyone I speak to, I say, just find your personal name. Don't worry about all that. Just let's get you up, unless you're a dentist earning 150 grand. Yeah, I say, don't worry about that. Let's just get you up and running. Buy your, your places wherever you're buying them. Do them in your personal name. Once you get to five or six, and you're no longer going to benefit from them super great interest rates like what Jay's just showed us there, and you're going to be paying the three and a half percent, then why pay three and a half percent in your name when you could pay three and a half percent in a limited company and get so many more benefits to it? But this is a very basic overview, guys. Exactly like Jay said there, you, we're not qualified accountants, far from it. All we could do is share our experiences with you. You have to go and get yourself checked out and not even just yourself checked out on where you are today, but yourself checked out on where you want to be in five years because you can't just switch these over to a limited company like that. It's very difficult. You have to incorporate it. It costs you a lot of money and it's a lot of headache. So when you buy in your personal name, you might as well just say to yourself, that's it. It's in my personal name now. I can't change it. The amount of money and aggro it would, it would cost you to, to change that property from your personal name to a limited company. and Because in, in effect, like I said to you, if it's in a limited company, they own it. So if you want to then put that into your personal name, you are buying that property off of your limited company. It's a whole new purchase. That's stamp duty, mortgage, survey, application, legal, solicitors, headache, and vice versa as well. So when you're entering into these types of deals, you want to know what your plan is going to be long term, right? And, and, and say to your accountant, listen, this is where I am today. But I plan on holding this property for 25 years. I'm going to be in a different place in five. There's only so much you can plan, guys, right? And obviously these plans are going to change, but I'm going to be in a different place in five years' time. And this is where I'd like to be then. So let's start getting people say all the time. Sorry, Joe, and I'm waffling now, but just no, go on, go on. <laughs> yeah, because people say all the time, like, oh, Damien, you know, I'm exiting this deal. Um, what's the best way to exit it and, and, and be the most tax efficient? I say, you're asking the question at the wrong time. You should have asked that question when you bought the property and structured it accordingly. So um, that's why these like this, this stuff that Jay's putting on for us right now, guys, is super important for you. And I know that a lot of it may go over your heads because it did for me when I first heard it. And it just takes a few times. But try to let it sink in. Um, and it's important to try to understand it the best you can right now because it will save you a lot of headache in the future. Thanks, Jay. Yep. All right. Good. Damien, may I uh, just, uh, in, uh, you know, if I may speak about uh, this, this thing, just what you just mentioned, uh, is that okay? Yes, fine. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, my name is Simon. Um, I know Jason. That's why I just get into the, uh, through the thing. So thanks uh, for the opportunity. Now, um, what Damien just said, right, it's exactly that uh, what I was doing. I've only started uh, building the portfolio about a year and a half. So now I've got four properties. What we realized, as uh, Damon said, that when you're looking into um, going into buy to let onto the like a limited company, and I did the calculations, and actually it worked out that you get high interest. But then again, that I realized that if I have four properties onto our personal name, my I, my wife and myself, and then that will benefit us to you know have the spending. And then, because then by then we're not going to get any more benefit because our, our income will be higher and we'll be paying 40% tax because we both have side incomes. Then we decided to go for buy to let. Now, the questions that I have for the buy to let, how easy is that going into the first property? Do we have to maintain a, a account for a couple of years or is it easy to get a mortgage if we just start our first one? If that makes sense. So yeah, sorry, buddy. Do you mean to buy your next property in a limited company? Yes, exactly. Because we have got four now, so we know that, right? We're not going to probably go yeah. and get any more benefit, you know, having our own personal name because that we got that four properties, that income we can use or personal we can take it out. Now we got to a point now that we're thinking because we're going to build portfolio, probably the best things to do on a limited company. Because we're not going to touch that money, we're going to just okay. go. You're asking, you're asking how easy is it? Yeah, you're asking how easy is it to get a mortgage in a limited company right now? Yes, and we don't have any account. We don't have any. I mean, we have yeah. got a company set a couple of yeah, years it's ago. Fine. It's fine. Yeah. Sorry. Buddy, 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 it's fine. It's super easy. You know what? Since this this whole mortgage relief situation actually opened up a load of doors for us, right? Because pre that, it wasn't easy. It wasn't straightforward. Lenders didn't like it. The amount of lenders that we could go to was greatly reduced. Since they brought in this mortgage relief situation and, lend, and, 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 and investors started going down the limited company route, lenders started opening the gates. Albeit there's only half a dozen, you know, a dozen, there's not that many. So you're limited to who you can go to. And I can, I can like Keystones, Cape Reliance, Paragon. I can, I can give you a whole load of, of names of lenders that you can go to, but it's super easy. And you know why? Because they're not interested in the accounts that your company holds. It's not like when you're going for car finance and they want to see that your company's got free. They don't care. Do you know why? 
because you're the guarantor. So the company's being used for like just the purpose of buying the property. So you could open a limited company tomorrow and that company could be the buyer of the property. But the company will not get looked at. You will get looked at. So in order to make sure that the, 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 the property, the, the, the loan could be serviced, because it's a buy-to-let mortgage, they're not going to be too interested in yours or your wife's income. They're going to be interested the same way with the buy-to-let mortgage that you took out on the properties in your name. They're going to be interested in how much rent that property is going to generate, right? And then we're back to the rent calculation. Is the rent going to be sufficient enough? to cover the mortgage payments. I'm the lender. I want to see if it's in your personal name 150 times what the rental pay, uh, what the mortgage payment is. If it's in a limited company, I want to see 125 times. So if you know that the amount of money that you're going to borrow is a thousand pounds a month and your rent is above 1250, that's fine. That stacks. But now because your company's got no accounts, you or your wife, the director and any shareholder that owns more more than 20% in shares, okay? So you can have multiple shareholders on that limited company, but if any of them own more than 20%, they have to go on the mortgage. So if you do like a JV with someone and someone goes like, I'll throw in 10, I'll throw in 10, I'll throw in 10, and your role is to be the guy that's going to put in the sweat equity and maybe take the, the, the headache of taking the loan, and they don't want to be on a the mortgage, they're not interested in that, then you better make sure they've got less than 20% in shares because over 20%, the lender wants them down on the mortgage. But with you and your wife, they're going to look at you and your wife and they're going to want to see, and this is dependent upon lender, they're going to want to see somewhere in the region of 15 to 20,000 pounds minimum as a salary. So although the, the mortgage product is dependent upon the rent you're going to achieve and they're going to be focusing heavily on that, they do want to see that you're earning something. And I'm sure that you are because you just said that you are. But for anyone else that is listening, that's thinking of doing this, if you're not employed, if you've got no form of income, lenders don't like that. They want to see something coming in just in case you've got a void period and you can cover it. It's more for the legislation, by the way, for, for, for safe lending, like in case anything happens to you no one could come down there and say well why did you lend to this guy in the first place he ain't earning no money he doesn't live nowhere he's freaking homeless why did you give him 58 grand to go and buy this flat in Doncaster are you crazy it's more to cover their own ass but they want to see some form of lending so the short answer is limited company super easy but you or your wife has to go down as a as, as, as a guarantor and what I do with my limited companies is that I don't open one limited company per property you could do you could open a limited company for every property that you buy no problem and still get a mortgage on it but it's headache because every time you open a limited company tax returns authorization codes bank accounts you have to have a bank account the lender will not even let you draw down you cannot even complete your mortgage until you've got a bank account opened with the same name as your limited company to fill out your direct debit mandate right so it's a separate bank account for every limited company headache so what i do is i group them this group of properties in doncaster i'm going to stick in one limited company who do i want to be the director of that probably me because it's a headache area and if anything happens to me i don't want to have to deal with that right Ones down south, oh, they're lovely. Let me put that little bundle into a limited company. My wife's name, she can then be the director of that. Anything happens to me, she's got that little, this little one over here with this. And, and the beauty of limited companies as well, you can pass shares out to people. So there's a bit of a long answer for you there, buddy, but I hope that helped. Was that clear? Oh, it's absolutely. Thank you so much. I mean, I think this is what, exactly what I was looking for. And one last question, because you are doing the Doncaster, um, what is the kind of capital growth up there? I mean, it looks very attractive, the price wise, the house and everything. But what is the capital growth you think? Right. Well, I'll, give you my, I'll give you my opinion after Jay's give you heat because nobody knows. Nobody's got a crystal ball. I'll tell you mine, but I'll let Jay go first. Go, Jay. Sure. Yeah, for up there, um, we, we went up there, I think it was 2017 or 2018. I said we went up to um, Liverpool, Doncaster, Darlington, done a bit of research. I mean, in Doncaster, for example, there were some, these kind of free bed houses were going for about 55, 60 grand. I and mean, then now we've gone back now, as in like June, July, August, that kind of time. They've gone up to about 78,000 ish. So I don't know. So per year, it's, it's hard to say roughly how much it is, but, but on average, maybe 15, 20 grand in about two, two, three years. So on average, maybe six, seven grand a year, possibly in that kind of thing. But each region has their own different kind of growth rates and there's some properties like for example during the last credit crunch still haven't gone back up 
to what they were before. So it depends on each section of where you're looking. So there's no, like, I don't know, there's no formula or, or rule, if you know what I mean. But where we are, they, they've gone up by about 15, 20 grand in about, what, three years or so. So on average, maybe five grand a year, but that can change. So all depends, all depends. Oh, thank you so much, Jason. Lovely. Cheers. Thank you. Some dad, yeah. That five grand a year, Jay, on, on, a, on a 60 grand property, there was about 4% a year, right? Yeah, on average, yeah, yeah. Um, my answer is, you know when you watch the Italian films and they go, forget about it. You know when they say that, forget about it. That's what I would say because the capital appreciation mm -hmm. of North, like, just forget about it. Like, you're not buying up there for that. Although, like, if, if you look, like, Jay just hit the nail on the head, right? There's so many places up North, right? And then other places as well, not just up North, where, where property prices haven't even risen in the past 15 years. If anything, they've come down a little bit. I know that sounds hard to believe, right? But you just have to, it's, it's location dependent. The reason that I think Doncaster's okay is because it's quite a busy little area. It's not far from Sheffield. Um, you've got the HS2 that's coming in, wherever that's going to be coming in. That's not going to be too far away. All right, it's not landing right in Doncaster, but it's not going to be too far away. So whatever positive impact that might have on the frigging UK, it, is, it, it will hopefully do something to Doncaster. But I think when you're buying up north, guys, I, I, I wouldn't like even do you know the, when you go like five percent, like even five percent on like sixty grand is like four grand. Like don't get me wrong, four grand's a lot of money, but like if, over ten years it's forty grand. In ten, over ten years it's forty grand. Forty grand in ten, like forty grand today ain't even really that much money. Like what's it going to be in ten years' time? It's not going to be that much, right? But if you can couple that with these these good returns, and I think anybody that buys up north, unless you're based up north, because if you're based up north, it's easier to manage them. If you're based down south, then it's a lot of headache to go up north. But a lot of people like to do it because they're going to get these types of returns. They ain't got to put too much money into them. They can get themselves to a point where they're at least covering their their existing monthly expenses they can give up their job and then they can start attacking their property investing journey or whatever they want to do more full time but the capital appreciation um is is, is not going to be as great as what it is down south um but but doncaster wouldn't be a bad chance there's a few places up look look at these like man how manchester's gone crazy now and has sheffield gone up so much over the years um but then what was it the other day jay in the room were you there when that lady said about leeds now leeds is an area that's been buzzing for like four years i, I know four years ago people were telling me go buy in leeds leeds is going to go crazy i know people up there that are doing developments and they're earning good money and yet this 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 lady bought a flat in leeds in freaking 2008 and paid 103 grand for it and today it's worth 92 like how could it be worth 10 grand less 15 years later um but that's why we say we haven't got a crystal exactly. ball. Because there's pockets of, of areas which have got up more than others, and then there's some that won't even move. But I think she bought a new build, didn't she? That woman. But but yeah. Yeah, new build, a flat, yeah. Yeah. All right. I've got another question there actually. It says, um, why is the mortgage term so long? So I think, well, when the mortgage broker looked up, obviously typed in the person details, come up um with all the deals. There were two-year deals, five-year deals, three-year deals. But the cheapest one, based on the information that was entered into the mortgage broker's computer, came up with this one. Um, normally, the buy to let mortgages, um, a normal mortgage is about 25 years. But this particular deal um, that, that West were offering is just 34 years. Even though there's nothing being paid off, like repayment, they just offered it as, I don't know, as a 34-year mortgage. So <laughs> it just just what, 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 what was an offer. Normally, that, that's over 25 years, but... It will make a difference anyway, because even if it was 25 years or 34 years, it's still going to be the same amount of money that's being lent and the same amount of monthly payments that are coming out of the person's account. So I don't know. That's just what, what not, not, not was offered. There's no particular reason for it. It's just one of it deals. How old was this guy, Jay? Um, 30, early 30s. Because sometimes what they do, the applicant dependent, like sometimes they will do that in order to, 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 to make the deal stack up for the applicant. Like sometimes depending on what their mm. income's like and their status, if they put a longer term on it, I think it helps to get the mortgage through for them. So that might have been a situation here. I don't know. But um, exactly like you said, like you get these terms, guys, 25 or 34 years, but it's the fixed rate period that you're more, unless you're going to go into a repayment, unless it's going to be like what Rem said about a repayment mortgage, you want to get that property paid off after 25 years and then, 34 years is another nine years on top. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really that. Yeah. All right. I think Wesley's got a question as well. He says, how quickly can you pull out the money and start again? And how much can you pull out? So with this one, um, it's a minimum of six months. You have to own the property six months before 
you're allowed to take out any money against the, the property. And the rules for this one, yeah, this is the additional borrowing rules here, right here, additional secured borrowing. So if you're looking to scale and you want to take out money against your property, if it's gone up in value, then most of them, not, not all of them, but most lenders want you to own a property for at least six months before you can extract the cash. There are some like Kent Reliance and, and a few others that will, that will allow you to take out money within the first six months of, of ownership. But um, with this particular product, um, you have to wait six months before you can take out any equity that's been created in this particular pro um, property. Um, and if you want to say, Damon, on that one? I'm getting all my buttons mixed up. I'm pressing <laughs> chat, I'm pressing share screen. Like, where am I going? No, buddy, you, have, like, you answered that perfectly. Yeah. I think, do you know, Joe, I will say though, Joe, I think you've got him a cracking product. I want to ask you a question about this once you've got through the rest of the guys, but I think yeah. you've got him a great mortgage here. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. All right, and H, it says, hi, I previously taken out a mortgage on a shared ownership property. Now it's been sold. Um, would I still be considered a first time buyer in regards to stamp duty? Now, this area is a shady area. So you once owned the property, but now it's sold. So technically, you're a first time buyer again. So on the forms for the solicitor, they ask, do you, do you currently own a residential property in the UK? So you're going to tick the section which says, no, I don't. So in theory, don't quote me, but in theory, you should qualify for the first time buyer stamp duty deal again because you don't own any residential property in the UK at this moment. That's as far as I know anyway. <laughs> um, another one on the iPhone, well, from iPhone, it says, what is the capital growth in Doncaster? And to clarify, um, if I would like to get a mortgage on a SPV, which is a limited company, do I have to show two years company accounts? And if it's just the first property or limited company, then what's the criteria? Yeah, so basically, they've been with some of this earlier. Um, some mortgage lenders don't like you to be, well, if you're buying for the first time under your personal name, is fine. But if you're buying for the first time under a limited company, a lot of lenders don't like that. So with this one, on average, the, the banks want at least two years company accounts if you want to obviously purchase a property for a limited company. There are some banks that will lend you lend to you on one year's company accounts, but I'm not sure which ones they are, but I know most of them want at least two years limited company accounts before you can actually purchase a property. Now, I'm not sure about if you're allowed to buy your first property for a limited company or not. Damien might know though. <laughs> Actually, bro, you know what I don't. But you, I, you've, I'm, 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 even here, where you've got that, you mean the, the first, but even this mortgage you've got there. One of my questions I was going to say to you was, how easy was it getting this mortgage arranged for them, considering it's a buy to let as their first purchase? Because when guys, what happens every time you throw something into the mix? I want to go lim like out of the norm. I want to go limited company. My first property is going to, your first property being a buy to let doesn't make sense or, or you know, to, to, to us it does because we're investors. But generally, from a lender's perspective, why are you buying a property to let before you buy a property to live in, right? So it doesn't make sense. Limited company, bad credit, low deposit, um, can't prove you, like all these things, you're just reducing the amount of lenders that you can go to. So on this one, Jay, um, how many lenders did your guy have access to to get a buy to let more? Mortgage for their first purchase? Um, I think there must have been about 10 to 12 at, at the whole market. I know it's probably about close to 100 or so, but about 10 to 12, because like you said, because of the restrictions, um, he doesn't own a residential property at the moment. And there's only a handful of lenders that will lend to you on your first property being a buy to let property under your personal name. But yeah, and one of them was Nat West at the rate it's decent as well. But yeah, yeah, so the panel of lenders gets reduced um, if you're not on your own residential property, but you still can get your first property as a buy to let. So, yeah.
I think, I think the more the story here, Jay, is that it, it, you, you're, you're nine times out of ten, like unless you've got something, like, you're always going to get the lending. The funding part of it is, is is a lot easier than what people think it is. Um, but you just, but, you, but that's why I'm saying this is such a great product because generally you'll get the funding when when you throw a spanner in the world, such as your buy to let being your first property, but you might have to compromise on the rate a little bit, or you might have to compromise on the loan to value. Maybe you won't get seventy five percent, but you got seventy five percent with a two point one interest rate on a buy to let with, with with a good lender in that west and, and the reason i like these good lenders because sometimes these less mainstream lenders throw in other bits and pieces that you know i'm not going to be so favorable to you um i think that's a great mortgage you've got them yeah is it good product good rate all right i've got another question here um it says yeah, that's for damien all right with a 60k deposit would you advise buying two in doncaster or one in birmingham so with 60K, you could probably get almost three properties in Doncaster. Because if we was to get something that was about 75 or maybe 72 or 73K in Doncaster, then that means overall we'd be putting down about, what, 20K buy-in, all the stamp duty, legal, et cetera, et cetera. So you probably get three properties in, in Doncaster for that, which will bring in over, what, a grand a month, about 60K. Now, in or one in Birmingham, I'm not sure about the prices in Birmingham. I know Rod is listening, so Rod knows about prices in Birmingham. So, maybe is 60k enough to buy a decent one or two properties in Birmingham, Rod? Um, well, rates in Birmingham have gone through the roof actually. So, if you even if you buy a mediocre property, I'm getting like even on the outskirts of Birmingham, properties that would cost you about 80 80,000, I'm getting like seven, 750, 800. You know, okay. when you put a property on, it goes too quickly and you think, I've underpriced it. So <laughs> yeah. basically, for me, I don't know what the rents are like in Doncaster, but for anywhere around Birmingham, two-bedroom flat is 800 A house can be a mediocre house, 1000 1300 So for me, I, I was just about to post something, actually. I have bought in these depraved areas and, you know, these northern towns. You don't get much capital growth. Mm. But it's still better than money in the bank. The one that I bought, I bought it for fifty. 10 years later, sold it for 50, but it was really good yield. The mortgage like was like 80 quid a month and I was renting out 500, so I still earned money on it. So it's all about if, if you can get the uh, decent amount of money off it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so, so for me, Birmingham, for me, it would be Birmingham because it's close to where I live. I can manage it, getting really good capital growth. Stuff I looked at before the lockdown for 200 grand, right, just before lockdown, is now 300 grand. It's just, it's just it's silly. It's just silly. So yes. for me, good comes to the appreciation up there. So, so with, with that sixty k, what could you all in sixty k, right? Or sixty k deposit, stamp duty, legals. So, what would be the price or prices you reckon for like a two bed or three bed house in Birmingham, roughly? Okay, you in Birmingham city centre, you ain't going to get anything, but mm -hmm. slightly out. You know, you've got. Areas like Smethwick, Oldbury, there's a few other. You, you might get something for about 160, 170. But another little tip for you investors out there. I've got properties that I don't really go to. Just send the gas engineer over. Set up property alerts. Because um, property that I thought was worth about 160 or 170, the neighbours are selling for 200. Prices have actually gone through the roof. So, you know, you, you just probably have to go a little bit further out of town. Wolverhampton's really, really good value. Warsaw is really good value. And again, it's £800 rent. Basically, remember, every single day, landlords are disappearing from the market. So there's less property. Like I say, on open rent, it hasn't even gone on right move. 31 room, room requests, people begging. There's actually a bidding war, but I took it off the market anyway. Um, but anyway, mm -hmm. just, just think about it. When I, when I use my right move searches, why don't I put, it's Birmingham City Centre plus 25 miles. That's how I, that's how I do it, you know? And, yeah. you know, one bedroom flat, two bedroom flats, you know. That's the way I do. How, how do you do your searches, Jason? Um, well, it depends what I'm buying. If I'm buying a short lease, then um I have to stick to my location within a mile, but I also look put the put the what what do you call it? Put the I forgot what it's called now, but I changed it to um low what did I change it to? Lowest price and also change it to um longest on the market. But generally, the ones with like short leases are the ones that have been in, on the market the longest because people don't want to buy them. And they also so say the cash buyer, don't they? They always say cash yeah, buyer. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But you can't get mortgages on them, so, so it's good. So in conclusion, 
I would buy in Birmingham or surrounding areas because I know the capital growth. Yeah. You know, um, and if the rents are fantastic in in Doncaster, if you're getting like eight hundred pound and your mortgage is only like two hundred, yeah. But pff, I don't know. I don't know. What, what would you do? What do you do, Jason? Do, three yeah. Doncaster or or one? <laughs> well, you don't know Birmingham really. But for yeah, me, yeah, I, I yeah. have to research Birmingham first. I have to research both and then decide what to do. Yeah. If you've yeah. got three properties that are going to go up in value, you know, mm. you're going to get some capital growth on. Yeah. But if you've just got three properties that are not going to go up in value and you're going to get a decentish return, I don't know, each to their own. Whatever you do, just don't leave it in the bank. Whatever you decide to do, it's like leave it. It's better going to be better than the bank, isn't it? Exactly. Even my properties that are in negative equity, they all make money. So, you know. Yeah. Because I like a mixture of both anyway, a bit of um, capital or appreciation plus cash flow as well. That's why I buy in North London mainly. But like you said, when you buy outside London, there's not as much, well, depending on what part you're buying in, it's more about cash flow rather than capital appreciation. But that depends on where you're buying. But it's, yeah, I know what you mean though. So hopefully, Seb, that answers your question. Let me add to that for him, Jay, just yeah. real quick. Seb, mm -hmm. I would say to you, neither, I would buy down south without 60K, right? Now, what I would say to you is, is where are you? Like, where, where are you based? Where do you live? Like, Rod just said there, like, he, he didn't get no capital appreciation out of his flat over in 10 years, but he earned 400, 500 pound a month out of it, and it was right on his doorstep. Like he wasn't based in London having to invest up north, right? So it may like you've got to, with every one of these little strategies that you want to do, you've got to put master Excel spreadsheet and convert everything into pound notes. What is it? How are you gonna make where's my money? Like is what you've got to ask yourself. So I'd say to you, Seb, where are you based? Like, are you based in Doncaster? Are you based in Birmingham? Living Surrey is too expensive. It's Croydon's up the road from you. Is it? I'm, I'm terrible with, with, with uh, uh, um, thingy, but I'm just trying to up the road from you. I'm buying one bed. Well, not I bought one for a few months now, but one bed flats in Croydon for 180 grand. 60 grand will buy you one of them. 60 grand will buy you one bed flat in, in Croydon. You can then split into a two. Might have to top it up a little bit for the refurb costs. But yeah, why? of course you can only get flats. What's wrong with a flat? That's 100% what you've got to do. I, th th there you go. There's your question. Do I buy a flat in Surrey or a house in Birmingham? or two houses in Doncaster. See, a lot of people are against these flats. I love flats. The majority of my portfolio is flats. Nothing wrong with flats. Like, you might get your, I don't know how old you are, Seb, as it goes. You might be like, but my, my, my dad, well, not now, my dad's bought loads of flats, but when I bought my first flat, my dad was like, what are you doing? You can't buy a lease older. And the older generation would tell you that. People of Rod's age, no, I'm joking, Rod's still young, um, would tell you that. I don't know how old you are. The cladding issue, then no, you don't buy flats normally with cladding on. Like you, not all flats have got cladding on, only a small percentage have, and that cladding situation is getting resolved by the way soon. There's too much pressure on them. But you don't buy a flat with cladding. When someone offers you a flat in a block that's got cladding, you say no. But a lot of blocks haven't got cladding. If the, if the cladding, if what you see is like stone tile cladding, that's no problem. Um, but furthermore, just go for conversions, Victorian conversions. You can get big period, like Victorian Warden, whatever they're turn of the century, 1900 the year they was built conversion big houses split into six flats normal size houses split into two flats don't definitely don't buy with cladding but see this is where you have to break down what your issue is right is your issue buying flats i know this is two separate people guys but just as a general rule is your issue buying flats or is your issue cladding see it's two separate issues don't get them mixed up if it's the cladding thing then just look for flats without cladding but me i love flats i think flats are great purchases i would not be off put by buying a flat in the slightest of course there's pros to be in the freehold but you can get freehold flats there's pros to buying houses of course but don't be put off so if your question then seb is a flat a flat in sorry or a house in freaking Birmingham, definitely a flat in sorry especially if you're based in sorry 100 percent buddy um, i've got another question in here jay but it's gone direct to me i don't think it was supposed to be i won't say the person's name in case it was but i'll yeah. read the question out because i think it's important for people and mm -hmm. they've said can you employ on a limited company and claim the wages yes you can and you probably could have even claimed furlough as well in fact i don't think you could because i didn't um but that I didn't put forward for it. But yeah, if you've, if you've got a limited company, you can then go down on the books. The director gets a salary and you can say it's going to be the 900 quid a month or whatever. Is it a thousand pound a month? Now you can earn 10, 10 grand a year, is it? Whatever you can earn per year that's non-taxable. So you could put yourself down as a director and you can earn the 880 quid a month or whatever it is. And then you can put your missus down or your mister down, whether you're a man or a woman, or whoever, as a, as, a, as, a, as a secretary or an employee earning X amount of money as well. Um, so yes, you can. That limited company... For the property you can go down 
on those books as an employee um, and earn a wage for your time. And so you should. You can claim back um, expenses against your house. If you work from home, you can. I don't know what the exact figure is. And again, I'm not an accountant, but tomorrow morning, the room at 8.30, Rosita is in there. We can press Rosita on this. But you can, uh, it's four and a half grand, I'm pretty sure. Four and a half grand a year. If you work from home, you can get four and a half grand a year for using your home as an office. Um, you could, look, guys, there's, with these things, you, you, you know, it's that sounding close to the wind and not uh, close to the line and not overstepping it. But you need to be like operating and, and you can't just have like one bite to let, or maybe you can't, I don't know, speak to your accountant, but you've got to be like, this needs to be above board. But yeah, you can. In short, the question was, can you employ on a limited company and claim wages? Yes, you can. You can employ people. You can put yourself down on the wage. No problem. Mm -hmm. All right. That's good. Any other questions from anyone else? I think that brings me to mine then, Jay, didn't it, if there's none? Yeah. <laughs> actually, do you know what you've answered it, actually? Mine was, uh, how, would you get, how did you get on getting the buy-to-let mortgage for the first purchase? You covered that. I was going to speak to you about the ROI, but you've, you covered that further on as well. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, the only one was the river. When you said about the river, could an alternative be, let's say someone sees a property in Doncaster and they love it, it stacks up, the deal's great, but it's near a river and they go, ah, shit. I love the flat, I love the house. Yeah, you've done that. I love the property, but Jay's told me I shouldn't buy because it's near a river. Could an alternative be for them to quickly get a local authority search done and check whether it's a flood risk area? Would you say that's a possibility? Yeah, it's possible. It's possible. But the only thing is, um, some mortgage companies won't lend on those particular properties. So when they do their, their, um, their searches via the solicitor and it comes up, that the property is within a flood zone, then they just pull out of the deal. Or you got to buy it cash. So if it's anywhere near a flood plain zone, then I wouldn't buy it personally at all. No, no, what, I'm, what I mean is, when you, when you said earlier, if, if you guys see a property near, near, or if you see a property near, near a river that yeah. you think might have the potential to flood, then walk away from it. Yeah. I'm saying rather than walk away from it, could it be worth them spending like a couple of hundred pound on a local authority search to check whether it is actually a flood risk area before they walk away from the deal? All right, they're risking a few hundred pounds, but they might be potentially saving themselves a deal. Do you think that's, that, that could be a, a good option for them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do that personally or get your sister to do it for you on, on your behalf either way, because they're going to check anyway. But yeah, that is worth it. And um, before you move forward. Yeah. Jay, so. look, at, look, at Cheryl, look at Cheryl's question. You're going to like this one. It's, it's so true. Oh, yeah. Have you ever dealt with any major works? Cost All right. Yeah, that's, oh, this one's off the point, though, but I haven't personally, no. Um, I've got some normal purpose-built ones. I've got ex-local authority ones myself. But I'm not, um, I've heard of some horror stories where some of the landlords have been getting, like, 16 grand bills, 20 grand bills because of all, all major works because they've got to do the roof or redecorate of the communal hallways, all that, all that kind of stuff. But personally, I haven't had none in my 20 years of, of buying flats. But um, what you should do as well, you can't really avoid some of them, but um, when your sister's obviously doing the searches for you, you always ask them to ask the freeholder and the managing agent about the major works. So you look at the major works that have happened previously, and look for the major works that are up and coming, if possible. So at least you've got a leeway of, of the past and possible future. And if there's any major works that are coming up in the next year or two or three, then it's up to you if you want to be stuck in that deal or if you want to pull out, or if you use that as a negotiation tool to try and get something off the price, because you know that you're going to be paying out a good 10 to 15, 20 grand, like a year or two or three down the line. But, um, personally, I haven't had any issues in terms of major works. Touch wood so far, anyway. You, mate, you got off lightly. I've been hit loads of times. I'm is not going to lie. Yeah, I've had, yeah, had a few of them. Mm -hmm. um, and you know what? This is the downside to buying with flats. And what Jay said there is right. If, if you're buying a place from the outset, you're going to ask, is there any future expenditure planned? Right. And they will tell you whether they've got anything planned for the next year or two, but they can't tell you like in, for the next five or 10 years. Who knows what's going to come up? Right. So you're only really covered for the first period. And if something does flag up there and then, it's the vendor's responsibility, not yours. You want to say to that seller, listen, this has come up and is due during your period of ownership i want that money off the price like you should be standing your ground i'm not saying you're going to get it but technically you would be within your rights and i always have done that um and on most occasions just just got it taken off the price or, or, or had, had it paid before buying it um but these things can come up 
if, if it does come up, they can't just say to you, right? If you have, if you haven't got a sixteen grand, sixty or like, I mean, that's that's an excessive figure, by the way, sixteen grand. I've never had nothing as high as that, but sixteen grand, and that's what you've got to pay. If you ain't got sixteen grand, they're gonna have to, you're gonna have to be, you have to enter into some kind of repayment plan to, to cover that amount of money, right? But either way, like obviously, it's a kick up the bum that you wasn't expecting. But this is why I talk about scale because that's not the only kick, a kick up the bum you could get. There's many kick, like Rod just told you there about. Not, see, that's the thing, right? See, you might get this one day but then you might be sitting there like rod and getting a little alert one day and your property price that you thought was 190 is now suddenly 210 and you made 20 grand so it works both ways right you get these ups and downs but this is why i say that scal handles all of that like if you're just going to go for the one if you go for more um it's, it's easier for you to cover yourself especially with the higher rental income but sure all these these things do happen unfortunately um but then see now again we're back on that same thing right don't let that be don't let that put you off of flats let that put you off of blocks of flats. So this is only going to happen in a block of flats. This is not going to happen in the conversion. There's so many different types of flats, guys. Ex-council, above a shop, purpose-built blocks, 1950-style blocks, 1980-style blocks that are freaking like built out of concrete and, and probably not even a mortgageable anyway, right? New builds. There's all these different types of flats. What do you want to go for? Well, like, I'm really worried about freaking cladding. Then don't buy um, any properties that you see cladding on or furthermore if you don't understand what you're looking at but you, you will anyway because if you agree to buy a flat and then your survival went down there he'd put an end to it straight away anyway and all you've lost is your five six hundred pound survey fee so i wouldn't worry about falling into that trap necessarily but go to conversions and the same with this if you're worried about um uh, uh you know high service charges or major works coming up don't buy in a block, buy in a house conversion, a one up and a one down. And there's loads of them around. You, you see them when you go on and right move and look for flats. That's what I'd say, Jay, wouldn't you? If that's a concern of yours, just stay away from blocks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're right. You're right. All right. Is it any more questions from anyone about the Doncaster ones or anything in general? Yeah, Jason, can hear me? Sally here. Are right, you right there? Yeah, hi there. Uh, by the way, you guys give some tremendous knowledge, by the way, so I'm always happy to listen. Um, and this is going to be out of the box, I'll be honest with you, on this one. Um, I know one of the main things, if you're going to do the single buy to let as an individual, then your credit scoring is very scrutinized a lot. Um, if you don't have a really good credit score, why are you looking the best way around it um, to, to, to get it secured if you don't have so much of a good credit score? Yeah, probably the best thing to do initially is maybe get, I know sometimes you get CCJs that last for about up to six years, then you're going to have to wait until that comes off your record before you can do anything. But to improve that, um, you might have to get some of them, you know, them credit cards like Vanquish and so forth that improve your your, your credit score as you go along. Um, but that's a tough one. Or maybe even do a JV with someone where you provide the cash, I mean, that person provides um, the actual mortgage offer for you or the applicant for you, but you provide the cash until your name's in, in the clear. So basically, you do it in under someone else's name, but um, you and them are going to be a JV partner. But failing that, I know there are some lenders that will lend, but the rates of interest that, you, that you're going to be getting are going to be quite high. And then those rates, those most companies are only maybe like few and far between. So it could be like, I don't know, five, six percent. But um best thing to do is just try and repay your credit if possible in order to move forward. But that's all I can think of so far anyway. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, cheer. thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else got any questions? No. All right, if not, I'm gonna go into the Enfield property. Again, this is about buy to let today. Um, not about short leases or BRR or flips, just a vanilla buy to lets, just so people get an idea of what to expect if they're gonna do a simple buy to let. So let me just go into the other one quickly. All right, <clears throat> close this chat down. All right, so this one is again a vanilla 
buy to let. One bed flat in Enfield. North London. <clears throat> All right, so this picked up location um, is where most of my properties are bought or been bought anyway. Same with Ricky, but he's not here tonight. He's, he's in Tenerife relaxing. But um, this location here, I like it because you get a mixture of capital appreciation and the ROI, which is return on investment is, is decent. So you get a nice fine balance of the two. So that's why I like this area. So with these, over a period of time, you get capital appreciation, you can pull out the cash, plus decent rental income, and then just move on to the next one. That's why I like this particular location. So in this location as well, I would look for maybe between 10 and 14% on average, which is lower than outside London. But um, if I'm buying a short lease flat, then I'm looking more towards a 14% because I'm getting it at a lower cost. If I'm buying a normal vanilla buy to let, it's going to be close to around the 10% mark on the ROI. So these particular properties, um, I built up some good links with local agents. So a lot of the time, they send stuff over to myself um, on a weekly basis or every two, three weeks, depending on what becomes available. And then they just say to me, yeah, do you want this one? Yes or no? If not, then they just put it, put it onto the open market. And then obviously someone else will buy it. But a lot of the time I got, I get most of these properties from my links um, from local agents. Now, with this particular one, um, I bought last year during lockdown one, um, completely on June 2020. It's a normal buy to let. Um, I just thought, let me just buy it because with this one, at least I own 50% of the block. I mean, if I own over 50% of a lot, the block, I, I can apply to buy the freehold of this block if I want to. So I just thought, let me just buy it. So this one here, this one bedroom flat, again, the person looked out, um, after it, it's own occupier. There's nice design in there. She looked after it, like properly looked after it. Um, not much needed doing to it actually. And the lease length was all right as well. Nicely decorated, she invested a lot of money into it. <clears throat> now this one was 210,000. Um, I had to put down a 25% deposit, which is 52,500. Um, I paid about £8,000 in terms of stamp duty. Um, the survey and the valuation fee was free. It's part of the mortgage deal. Um, we've got a broker fee costs I had to pay. And again, roughly about, this fees, 1500 So all in on this particular one was roughly about 62 k And with this one as well, um, the person already served a Section 42 notice to the freeholder. Um, to extend the lease. So I was getting a long lease on this one as well. So I just thought, you know what, let me just buy it. I got two, two in this block already. Um, the rent's out at a decent rate. So I thought, let me just buy it. Now for this one, um, I went under the guarantee rent scheme. Um, so this one, I'm getting about a grand a month for it. On open market, it's roughly worth about 1,150, but I prefer the guarantee rent schemes because I like the regular income coming in every month. Now, <clears throat> the service charge for this flat is £116, which is um, obviously, if you have a flat, you've got to pay service charge every month so they can look after the communal areas, take the bins out, clean the hallway, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the mortgage for this one um, on a monthly basis was three two four. Um, so this one making roughly about 560 profit under the guarantee rent scheme. Now, if I was to do it on the open market, I could earn a bit more and get about £710 a month um profit but i prefer more of a hands-off kind of kind of mentality so just giving it to the normal provider uh, make my little little change per month and then just rent it out that way now with this one this in that same block as well this was june i said i bought this one during what june 2020 a year later these ones are going for two two three five now so within the space of like a year a year and a couple of months it's gone up by about 20 25 grand already <clears throat> so i can't complain so i'm happy that i bought it during lockdown one when people were a bit scared to buy or thinking that there might be a crash of some kind so that's what i mean it's a mixture of capital appreciation as well as um, cash flow per month so in this one i've got equity straight away and that's after one year so again the yield i worked out the yield um it's twelve thousand. we'll divide it by the purchase price 
Wix at about what 5.71% yield. Again, that's an overview. I don't really use that much. Um, the ROI in this case could, could no work needed to be done. Um, this one was 560 times that by 12. And then I divide it by how much money I put into the deal. And it works out at about roughly about 10.8%. So in theory, within about 10 to 11 years, the cash that I've put into it, I can obviously get my money back after about 10, 10, 11 years worth. Now, the only thing that I had to do to it was do a gas safety cert. Um, I had to do an electric certificate. The gas safety was about 65 pounds. Um, this one, electric cert was about 95 pounds, five year electric cert. The person left all the white goods. So that was all right, left the cooker left the washing machine and also left the, uh, uh, where else, where else, where else? Washing machine, oh yeah, and the fridge, because they were all integrated, so they all worked out all right. It was nothing to do, no refurb or anything. So just straightforward vanilla buy to let. So again, stamp duty, I checked this out before. Um, you do the normal website, stampduty.co.uk or org.uk. Eight thousand pounds, roughly. You can check yourself. Um, again, the legals <clears throat> similar to the other one. The only thing is not going to be obviously nil stamp duty. That would be eight eight thousand in that particular section there. But on average, it's about one thousand five hundred stamp duty. Um, legal, should I say, for solicitors' fees. Uh, this particular mortgage company that I used, I use um, Kensington with this one. This one was a twenty five percent. Um, deposit, which means 75% loan to value, um, two year fixed over that period of time, normal 25 years, like I said. The rate that I got was 2.59% um, over the 24 months, which again, um, two year fixed. Um, there was a completion fee of 1999, which I added to the loan anyway. Um, we've got to pay £10 to release the deeds and so forth. When you've got £80 admin fee, £18 worth of transfer fee, when they obviously the mortgage company transferred the funds over, so it wasn't too bad. <clears throat> um, yeah, the usual £324.76 a month for the first 24 months, which is a two-year fixed. So it's all right, it's not too bad. And now <clears throat> you've got early repayment charges. So if I break the contract after the first year, I've got to pay 4,500. They call this the ERC charge, early repayment charge. Or if I break it after or during the year two, it's roughly 3,000 pounds. Now, when I did the short lease um, masterclass, sometimes um, well, people ask, oh, so once you extend the lease, when can you extract your money out of it? Now, sometimes depending on what mortgage deal you have, and if you really want to take the cash out within the first two years of extending the lease, probably do it in the second year of extending the lease. Because um, in the second year, if you're making, for example, like you've extended the lease and it, you uplift of about what, 50, 50K, 45, 50K, and you want to use that funds to go in, onto a new purchase, then even if you break the contract, the fixed term contract at, within the second year, it's only going to cost you maybe about three grand. So that you can just put down as part of your expenses, so it's not too bad. Or you can wait till the final um, two years is up, and then after that, can extract your cash, and there's no ERC charges. So ERC means early repayment charges, basically. Yeah, so that's basically it for this one anyway. <clears throat> so I'll go back and recap. Vanilla buy to let. North London, 62K-ish buy-in. And you're gonna have a return on investment, roughly about 10%-ish on average, but within the first year, um, that, that particular property is gonna have about 25 grand already. So I can always extract the cash if I want to, and then move on to the next deal. Yeah, so that is this one. Any questions on this, on the one bedroom flat in Enfield, how it all works out? I've got one here actually. How do you have any examples of ROC calculation? I don't have any examples at the moment of return on capital employed. 
but I can message you some afterwards if you want to. That's for um, from me. What was the rate on the mortgage? All right, the rate on the mortgage for this one. Let me just get this one up. This rate on the mortgage was 2.59% fixed for two years. Now, because I've got like, basically when you have over four properties, then you see more of a risk. When you have over 10 properties, you're seeing even more of a risk. And if you have over 20 properties, you'll see as even more of a risk. So I've managed to get like 2.59%, which is not too bad. But if, for example, you have under 10 or under four property, you'll probably get a better rate than myself. So, but 2.59% fixed for two years is, is not so bad. That's the rate that I got at the moment. All right, I got another question here. It says, what is the trick to extend, to extend the lease without a higher cost? What should you look at before you buy a low lease property? All right, so with these low lease ones, what should you look for before you buy it? All right, with, with low lease flats, which is different to buy to lets, I always look at the end value. Um, I look at the lease extension cost, and then that will determine how much I actually put in my offer towards a property. But I always look for a good 20 to 25% uplift um, if I'm buying a short lease flat, because I want to pull out at least maybe 75 to 80% of the money that I've put into the deal. So um, that's what I look for generally. Uh, is it common for low lease flats to be cash purchases? All right, for all right, the question says, is it common for low lease flats to be cash purchases? So far, the majority I've seen. All right, so cash purchases for low lease flats. So again, these are separate to buy to lets, but um, with low lease flats, generally I look for leases between 60 to 80 years in length. So 60 to 80 years in length. Now with them ones, you don't need um, to be a cash buyer. You can get mortgages on those particular ones. Um, so the mortgage companies, that I use for low lease flats. Um, you've got Keystone Mortgages, you've got Kensington, you've got the Mortgage Lender, you've got Foundation Home Loans, and you also got Capital, Capital Loans, I think it's called. Yeah, Capital Loans. Those are the main four or five that I use for low lease flats. If the lease is below 50 years, then yeah, you're definitely gonna need to purchase using cash or using bridging and with bridging you can either get a bridge to let or just use bridging or just use cash but you can get a mortgage on the low lease flat and then what they do as well um, if you're getting a mortgage on a low lease flat the, at the end of the mortgage term the lease cannot be lower than 50 years at the end of the mortgage term so last year i bought um two i said during lockdown one um, completed the one in March 2020 and one in April 2020. And with those ones, I think one of them was a 64-year lease and the other one, I think, was a 63-year lease. Now, with a 64-year lease, they gave me a 13-year mortgage. And with the 63-year lease, they gave me a 12-year mortgage, a buy-to-let mortgage, interest only. So you can get mortgages on properties with low leases. which is obviously different to a buy to let, but the rates are still good. I'm still getting like two point something percent in terms of the, the mortgage deals. And that's with a short lease one as well. All right. Any more questions? Oh, how long does it take to extend the lease? All right, this one, again, this is all in the short lease masterclass, but it varies. So let me give you an example. I'm doing, two now um one of them i started well basically i wrote to the freeholder in july i think it was july july of this year um i asked them voluntarily if they're willing to extend the lease so they wrote back to me and said yes and then i've asked for a quote to extend the lease to 99 years one two five years and 90 years above what it is at the moment 
with peppercorn ground rent. Now, a negotiation went back and forth, back and forth for, I don't know, three or four letters or so emails. Emails were letters, the letters were sent by emails. And then I think it was, I think it was late August. That's when we agreed on a lease extension fee. So that was one month in. And then they wrote to my solicitor on, I think it was the 6th of September, once we've agreed the terms. And then from the 6th of September, they've given me three months to complete on the lease extension. So hopefully um, I should be completing on the 7th of November for this particular deal. So from the end of July, I think it was July 28th, yeah, 28th of July, that's when I started proceedings, as in I wrote to them. So you could say August, September, October, November. So this particular one has taken four months to extend the lease. Um, and then obviously once the, the documentation comes through on the 7th, then they're going to be sent off to the land registry. The land registry will register it. But I think because of COVID, there's a few delays in terms of registering it. But this particular one took about three, took about four months to extend the lease. Hope that answers the question. Uh, you got any more questions on buy to lets or short leases? Hey, son. Hi. Hello. Um, Hello. You know, you do guaranteed rents. Um, yeah. Is that something that's set by the councils or do you have like any negotiation kind of angles with that if they came in like really low? Just curious about that. Yeah, no, these ones have got set prices for the councils. Again, they got set um, LHA rates, local housing associate, housing, um, I think it's, authority rates, LHA rates. Yeah, so they got set rates. But because I've been with some of them for a long time, they always give me the best rates, if you know what I mean. But if you're new at uh, Office Street and you haven't got any properties of them, a lot of the time they try and give you the, the minimum amount. But so far, I've, because I've been with them for quite a while, the, the guys always said to me, look, like you've been with us for 18 years or 17 years, whatever it is, you've been a good landlord, blah, blah, blah. We'll, we'll, we'll give you the best rates. That's with the councils. Um, with them, the housing associations, um, because they got margins, is it, they always offer you like a set rate initially. Like for this one, um, it's about what? It's a grand a month for this one. But I don't know. It's, 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 it's just a set rate, generally, generally. But it also depends on the size of the property as well. Sometimes you've got some big one beds, sometimes you've got some small one beds. This one is a, like a normal size one, so they're giving me a grand a month for it. But um, of course, they have to make their margins. They have to make at least £125, £150 a month extra on what they're giving it to me for, just so they can, I don't know, make, make profit and pay their, their overheads. But um, you can't really negotiate too much on the guarantee rent schemes at the moment. But, but yeah, that's my theory on it anyway. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right. Hi, Chase. Oh, yeah, I've got another question here, actually. So this one says, um, what if they refuse to extend the lease or is the legislation that a freeholder must oblige to? I have a friend, they bought a low lease, but they asked to extend the lease and got a ridiculous price and now it's not worth them extending it. Is the lease extension process regulated or can they just uplift if as they wish all right so if they've bought a property um the right or well, the law is you have to own it for a minimum of two years before you can extend the lease now what you can do um is also write to them voluntarily and ask if they're willing to extend the lease before the two years of ownership is up after the two years of ownership um what you can do as well is serve them with a section 42 notice and then they have to, they're obliged to or have to extend the lease by 90 years on top of what it is now with peppercorn ground rent. So they have to extend the lease. Then after that, now you have to negotiate some form of premium with them. <clears throat> with one of my ones, um, there was a dispute between myself and the freeholder about what, what they were charging. <clears throat> this one was a two bed flat. Um, they were trying to charge like 22 grand to extend the lease, but I thought it should be a bit lower, like the mids, mids, mid teens, 14, 15, 16 grand. So, but they they weren't like they dug their heels in basically and said, no, we're not, 
we're not lowering it. So what I had to do, I had to get my lease extension guy involved. Um, he went around there, done the lease extension survey, um, produced like a 22 page report. And then his findings came back and said that the lease extension should be around, I think it was like 15 and a half K. So he wrote or sent back documentation to their solicitor and their freeholder. And then they came down in price to 15 and a half K. But I had to pay, I think it was about 600 plus VAT to get the report done. So if there's a dispute between yourselves and the freeholder, I'd get a lease extension person to go around there, do a lease extension survey, get, get them to, to produce the report and then send it off to the freeholder and to the freeholder's surveyor. And then if they're still not budging after that, then you have to go to a tribunal and then the tribunal will decide um, the cost of this new lease extension. So that's the main process of, of extending the lease. Yeah. All right, so that one's done. Oh yeah, can I ask Alicia? Yeah, you can. So basically the person said, can you ask for the lease extension process before? Yeah, basically, um, if you're purchasing the property with a short lease, you can ask your solicitor to ask the freeholder if they're willing to extend the lease before um, the two years of ownership is up. So that's during the process of buying the property because your solicitor has to write to the freeholder anyway about the, the ground rent and, and some other issues. So you can ask them um, to ask for permission for you to extend it before two years of ownership. So that's one way of getting around it. Or you can ask the vendor to serve a section 42 notice on your behalf. And then when you complete, you assign the section 42 notice over to yourself when you complete. I mean, that way you can finish off the process of the lease extension. So that's another way of, of ext oh, a lease extension before you actually purchase the property. Jay, can I add to that? Yeah, yeah, go on. <clears throat> so just real quick, first of all, on REM is one REM. What it is, is nine times out of 10, when you go for these rent guarantee schemes, these lease schemes, right? Nine times out of 10, you're not dealing directly with the council. Nine times out of 10, you're dealing with an agent, somebody that's got tender for that area. And they're an agent, a representative, of the council, right? So like, if I go to one of them, or if Jay goes one to one of these agents, and they'll say, listen, the, 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 the scheme that we're on right now, the rates for this borough, because every borough has different rates, the rate for a one bed flat, the rate for a two bed flat is X amount. So that's all they can give you, right? It's all they've got to play with. But it depends on what scheme they put it on. Sometimes they could put it on a nightly scheme. Sometimes they could put it on a scheme that's has in distressed people, right? So quite often, if, if you're willing to allow your property to be used um, for, for, for people that are in, in distress, you, you can get more money for it. And, and they're also, they also get a management fee on top from the council, right? Um, and, and they might be willing, like Jason said, to give you a little bit more. For what reason? Maybe they're trying to get the deal. Maybe you're a preferred client like what Jason is, and he's giving them so much business. So that negotiation is easier to do when you're dealing with an agent like a representative, um, but there's only so much meat on the bone, only so much for them to play with, right? That's on Remy's point. On um, someone's question there, I forgot who it was that said that about the lease situation. Just, just to reiterate what Jay said, but maybe in a different way, um, although Jay, you said it perfectly, is that when it comes to renewing a lease, you've only got two options. There's the statutory route and the voluntary route. So it's two ways of renewing your lease, statutory and voluntary. Now, you really want to do it the statutory route. By doing it the statutory route, you've got more benefits. It's, it's, it's weighed more in your favor. That's the route where you serve the Section 42 notice. Don't get too overwhelmed with that stuff because all of that stuff is done by the solicitor. You can do it yourself, but that's the legal department. Just know this. There's two routes, statutory, okay, or voluntary, and that you prefer statutory. But the problem is you're not um, you, the statutory route is not applicable to you until you've owned the leasehold flat for two years. So as much as you might want to do this, you can't do this until you've owned it for two years. So you either buy it and wait two years before you go down the statutory route. That's the better option for you. 
or you ask permission to the freeholder, please voluntarily will you renew my lease? That freeholder can say to you, no, I don't have to. Like you haven't got the right to renew your lease until you've owned it for two years. Someone answers no. But they may say, yeah, no problem, but I'm going to charge you this. And they're going to ask you for an amount of money, right? It's just like, it's, 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 it's what they're saying that they're going to do under a voluntary rate. Now you can battle that. You can say to your surveyor, you can instruct your own leasehold surveyor to go and value it for you and negotiate on, on your behalf, but you're going to foot the fees both ways. So you're going to pay for the survey for the freeholder. That's when the freeholder says to you, listen, I'll give you a price. You're going to have to pay for my survey to go down there. That's a pound. You've got to pay now for the survey to go down there and give you a valuation. If you then disagree with that, like 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 the person who asked the question, their friend is, you can then pay for your own survey to another thousand pounds. And then the two surveyors will negotiate and they'll use comparables. One survey will say, well, I will do the lease around the corner for this. And the other one will say that. And they'll battle it out until you get to a point um, where it's a price that either you, you're happy with or you're not happy with. And, and they won't budge no further, in which case you walk away and wait the two years. But there definitely is a way that you can do it when buying it. And one is like what Jay said. So if, if you're buying, and this is the way that I always try to do it, by the way, I don't want to buy the property renew the lease later. I want to re renew it as I'm buying it. But most sellers will push back. They, they, they won't want to do this because it's too much headache for them. It's going to cost them money. So what I do is I say to the seller, one of, one of two things, if they really are adamant about not doing it, I'll go down Jay's route. I'll say, can you then serve the notice for me? You've owned it for two years. The statutory route is applicable to you. Serve the notice for me. I'll pay for it. And you assign the rights to me and I'll take over. At least that way you haven't got to wait two years. You're getting the statutory process underway and you can renew that lease within, like Jay said, a few months if you own the property. But me, I'd rather get it done upon purchase. Why would I rather get it done upon purchase? Because then my 25% deposit is based upon the overall purchase price and lease renewal cost. If I buy the property and then have to renew the lease afterwards, I'm going to have to come up with 25% of the purchase price, let's say that's 200 grand, so 50 grand, and then I'm gonna have to come up with the 30 or 40 grand to renew the lease. So 50 plus 30 or 40 is 80 or 90 grand out of my pocket, right? If I get the lease renewed for 30 grand on top of the 200 grand purchase price, that's 230. Now my 25% of the 230 is now gonna be 60 odd grand, 58 grand. So I'm kind of, I've, I've got to find 58 grand rather than 80 grand. It's so much easier for me. But your seller's going to push back on that. The seller's going to be like, I don't want to do it. Otherwise, I would have done that myself. It's going to cost me too much money. It's too much headache. I can't be asked. It's going to take too long. All of the things that yeah, you're going to have to kind of wrap that. Don't worry. I've done this a million times before. I've got my solicitor on hand. I am going to take care of all the headache. I'm going to spend all the money. I'm going to put all of the expense, I'm going to do it a lot. And I'm going to get it ready before our transaction is even ready to go. And if for whatever reason, the purchase is ready before the lease renewal, I'll complete anyway. But obviously, you're going to do your best to get that lease renewal ready, right? And that's the way that I plan to get done at the same time. So there is a way to do it at the same time. And that is your more preferred option. But a lot of the times, these sellers don't want to play ball. And hence why they go to people like Jay, because uh, they know that he'll just take it. as. And you're battling against that, by the way. That's what you're up against. Like, if you go in there trying my way, and then Jay walks in there and says, don't worry about that. Forget forget that guy, Damien. I'm going to pay the amount of money that you want and not have to put you. I can't, I can't win against that. Unless I talk really, really smoothly. I ain't going to win against that, right? Because that's going to win. So if you come up against someone like Jay, who's going to take it as it is, then you're going to be on the back foot. But I would always try and push for that first. Um, I don't know if you do, Jay, but I always try and push for that first. Yeah, true. It makes sense. It makes sense. It makes sense. Less money involved. <laughs> All right. So another one, it says, um, if an advert says cash buyers only, that means low lease property. How rigid are they? For example, will they be willing to sell to, to someone who has an agreement in principle in place or has bridging accepted? Yeah, a lot of the time, um, a lot of adverts say low lease, well, says um, cash buyers only, but if it's, like I said, if it's if the lease is over maybe, what, 58, 59 years, 57 years, then you probably can get a mortgage on it still. But anything below that, then you're probably going to have to use bridging or probably cash to purchase it. And you can't get a buy to let mortgage on them ones. Um, yeah, so that's probably the best way to answer that one. But yeah, that's fine. If you've got an agreement in principle with one of the lenders that I mentioned before, and you go into the go into the stage and or phone them up and told them that you've got an agreement in principle in place, then then it should be fine. Or if you've got a bridging agreement in place, then it should be fine as well. But those ones with cash cash buyers only, 
it, it, it varies. I've seen one where the lease was about 31 years. If it's 31 years, then there's no way that you can use, obviously, bridging, not bridging, um, a mortgage to purchase it. So you have to use bridging or cash to buy them ones. But if it's above 60 years and above, then definitely if you go in with um, an agreement in principle or a bridging offer accepted, then it, it should be fine. It should be fine. And what's this one? iPhone always says, what do you say? Can we agree the lease extension? I think that relates to the other question from before, I think. Yeah, all right. So any more questions on these ones? Oh, where are areas? Can we agree? Yeah, Damien's answered that one, actually. Um, he just says, can we agree at least extension before buying the property? So Damien just basically answered that question just now anyway. All right. On that, cash, on that cash one, Jay, as well, when they're saying about that, what mm. Jay said, it was 100% correct. But also, bear this in, in mind as well, guys, when these agents say this, that's not always the case. Like, they'll say that, but when you get on the phone and start talking to them, um, and you like, obviously, it has to be exactly like what Jason says there. Um, like, the point I'm trying to make is, if it, if it says cash, but you're not cash, don't automatically rule yourself out and think they're not going to listen to me, right? Because you could be in for a chance. Obviously, if the property is not mortgageable or bridgeable, then it has to be cash, right? But sometimes they put cash buyer. And when you dig a little bit deeper, it turns out there's a way of doing it where you're not. Who's in the chat right now? One second. Um, Livia, should we, should we call Livia? I don't know if she's going to tell you, I don't know what she's doing, but Liv, that deal that you found on a day with me, I'm pretty sure that one said cash buyer. I don't know if she's going to come or not, if she's going to take it. Oh, she is, there she is. Yeah, Liv. I'm here. Yeah, was yeah that, so both of them have been cash buyer, um, and I managed to get the vendor of the first property to agree to serve a section 42. And um, I'm actually still in negotiation with the other one. Um, well, yeah, I think it might have ended, but um, they were, it's a 38 year lease and they, um, they're they refusing to service section 42. So it does have to be a cash, full cash purchase and um, applying for the lease. But I got in contact with some lawyers who have dealt with that block of flats before and they've contacted the freeholders on my behalf um, and they've agreed that they would be happy to extend the lease um, voluntarily. Um, so, um, yeah, there's there's ways around, you know, finding out um, how to extend it. Yeah. So, guys, just to be clear what Olivia just said, right, she's seen a property online on Rightmove, right? And and it says in there, cash buyers only, um, rather than her just accept that maybe, you know, if she doesn't want to buy cash or she can't buy cash, rather than accepting that, she's got on the phone and found a way around it. Um, and on the first one, it's worked perfectly. That's the deal she's going for now. On the second one, she's come up a bit against a bit of friction. But look at the moves that she's making. Like now she's gone away and found out who the lawyers were that have represented people in that flat. And now she's like, she's not even taking no for an answer. And let me tell you this, and I'm sure she won't mind me saying this, Olivia's not a, a professional property investor she freaking acts like one and and you know what she's as good as one like by no means an idiot right but she's definitely beginning of her journey and so don't be don't think to yourself that you can't do this you fully can like try to obviously you've got to know a little bit about what you're talking about but it's having the courage to get on the phone and say like what can we do here i want to buy this flat i love the flat what are the ways around this and then even when you do get a no like olivia did on the other one still go out there and try and find a way to, to make it happen but the first one where she did get on the phone and say I want to buy this flat. I love it. She actually got on the phone, um, sitting in my office and made an offer over there without even viewing it. And the guy was like, well, you haven't viewed it. She was like, no, I know. And, and, and you see on the Instagram, I know, I know. We don't always view our properties. A lot of agents suggest that we should come down. But I just want to know right now, would my offer be accepted? And the guy on the phone said to her, whatever he said, like, yeah, but you've got to come a few. She's like, I'll be there tomorrow. What time can I get in there? And then she made an appointment there and then went down there, got it agreed, and then said, like, I, I want to buy this, but I'm, I'm not going to buy it. Like, I want to serve a section 42. I want to get the lease renewed. Is that going to be possible? And the whole spiel, yeah, I'm not, like, whatever she said in the day, she could tell you what she said in the day, but I'm not going to delay you. Anything that they want to hear, right, to try and and I'm not saying that's going to work every single time. There might be times when it's not, but the point is, is to put up a fight. The point is, is to go for it. You've got to be in it to win it. You've got to try it. And, and for every 
I don't know, five no's, you might get a yes. Or in this instance, for every every two tries, it looks like she's going to get a yes on both of them, but definitely on the first one. Was that um was that kind of how it went down, Liv? Or did I get anything wrong then? Hi, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't find the button. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much exactly how it went. And um, yeah, but uh, you know, a bit of um bit of kind of emotional um not on my behalf but i kind of played the emotional card to the agent um you know to just kind of encourage them that i was a really serious buyer really wanted the flat so um yeah the, that's that's been how it's kind of happened you used your charm you used your person and i say that all the time guys don't don't like this thing but oh i don't know oh it's a lot of money Oh, it's a bit of a, like, all that, like, I think I, from, it might, like, get you saying, I love the property. I want to buy it. I really do. I can't pay this amount of money, or I can't buy it with the lease as long as what it is, or whatever the, whatever that is that you want to say, but I love the flat. I'm going to make it happen. Can you help me? Like, all that kind of, however you want to play it, whatever tactics suit your personality, I suppose. Um, And yeah, Liv, you played that one well. Yeah. That's what I wanted to say, Jay. Um, what area is that in? Can't tell you. It's classified information. <laughs> That was down south. That was down south. That was Eastbourne. Um, and do you know what, right? We actually proved... Sorry, I don't that... want Jason on my patch. <laughs> I know, I know. Get rid of him. Get rid of him. We actually uh, proved on that day, but we've proved several times that you can buy properties in the south of England with the with the types of money that you guys are talking about. Like, and 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 you're getting like, but these spots are everywhere. They honestly, they are literally everywhere where you can find these properties. Um, as long as like I say all the time, like your property type, your property value, your 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 location, your strategy, like all them things have to be in sync with with you yourself personally. But um, they are out there. You you can make it happen. You can. Um, but yeah, forget what I said. There's classified information, but there's loads of these spots. There's loads of them, Jay. Nah, that's good. That's right. Then. Yeah, we're tight. Well, then. All right. Any more questions on buy to lets or short leases? Yes, I have a question, Jay. Um, right, you're right, you're right, Jay. Yeah, good. Yeah, how you doing? Yeah, yeah, I was question. just going to ask about when you're renting out the properties to the council, do they have a specific criteria or anything they need, i.e. like fire doors or anything like that? Or is it? Um, not, yeah, not for not for my ones. Like, for example, like Ricky was doing some HMOs and then the council officer came around and he had to change this and change that and draft it, excluders and, and fire doors and whatnot. But for my ones, because my ones are only like small units, like one beds, two beds, three beds, and studios. Um, they're just the basic requirements, like the furniture. And they give you a list of what furniture to put in them. Um, um, they need to have locks on the windows for child safety, because sometimes the ones that I buy are either on the ground floor, first floor, or second floor. I don't buy anything that's higher than the second floor. And the blocks cannot be higher than the second floor, because I, I don't like tower blocks and things like that. So make sure you put child locks on the windows. Um, that said, certain furniture has to be in the property. Um, and that's it, really. Yeah, nothing else. Nothing else. No, nothing to do with, like, fire doors or, or anything like that at the moment. But also, you need to have um, a fire and risk assessment report done from the management company. And then that needs to be forwarded to them as well. Because since um, Grenfell, a lot of the councils and local governments are hot in terms of that health and safety but that's provided by the management company the block management company but in terms of the internals no just just basic requirements really along with a gas safety um energy certificate um your electric certificate um you need the carbon monoxide detector in the kitchen some of them might need a heat detector as well um a fire blanket as well which is like 50 pound or so from b &Q. But that's about it. That's the basic requirements, generally. Perfect. Thank you very what much. What are you saying there, Lamry, about the fire risk assessment from the freeholder? That's for the communal areas. Yeah. Yeah. So are you talking about our one that you just done? Uh, no, I was just finding out in general. Yeah. Just literally so just finding using, out in general. Using your one as an example, my guy would definitely take that, I'm sure, right? But your front door is directly off the street, isn't it? That's correct. 
Yeah. Yeah, so there's no communal area there. So because there's no communal area, you won't be um, requiring a fire risk assessment. And the fire risk assessments are only for shared communal areas, and that's what's done by the, the managing agent on the freehold of the block. The, 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 the carbon monoxide detectors, the fire blankets, the window restrictors, all that kind of stuff, Jay, is 100% right. Um, and if you've got a boiler in your bedroom, you will also need a carbon monoxide detector in your bedroom as well. Yep. Um, but what you might have an issue with and what you guys need to be aware of, these fire doors are to do with escape routes, okay? So so it depends on the location of where you're sleeping and the location of the kitchen. Do you have to escape via the kitchen from where you're sleeping? And I think on your flat, the bedroom, if you was asleep in the bedroom and the most likely place of a fire taking place is going to be in the kitchen, I think you have to escape via the kitchen to get out the front door. Am I right? That's correct. Yeah. So when you're one there, they would want more. And But you've got an opening from the bedroom area they would tend to want a 60 minute fire door not a 30 minute a 60 minute fire door on the bedroom um but we could possibly have we got a bedroom have we got a window in the bedroom area no yeah, no window in there no yeah because there's no escape so what you really want is a window that's this just, just a 450 wide opening so if you've got a situation like that guys where your escape route from your sleeping area is is via the kitchen which is the area where you're most likely to have a fire they'll say no sir we want a fire door on that bedroom because the argument being is that you're you're going to be when you're sleeping if a fire breaks out and you're asleep that's when you're in your most vulnerable if you're awake sitting on the sofa you've got enough time to either put it out or, or, or leg it right but if you're sleeping no so they're going to want a fire door but 30 minutes is not going to be enough it needs to be 60 minutes or failing that they want a fire escape window and a fire escape window is basically a window that can open 450 mil wide because that's what they they class as the standard opening for someone to get through i'm not sure i'd get my fat ass for a 450 mil opening but the average joe would um so bear those, those points in mind that's when your fire door really becomes a problem or if you're on a, on a loft conversion right if you've got a loft conversion in there and you're up in the loft and then you're coming down the stairs and then you've got open plan to the kitchen they're not going to like that either they're going to say you've got an open plan kitchen and lounge area downstairs with no fire door dividing the upstairs from the down we need a fire door somewhere um so that's when they, they really come into play fantastic thank you very much for that information thanks okay. all right um there's another question on short leases but what i'm gonna do um let me just get that presentation up quickly um but someone's asked about um auction properties um basically by damien can chat as in talk, <laughs> while I look at the other presentation about the short leases, I mean, I'll answer the short lease question. But um, this question says, um, anyone has experience in auction properties? And I know this may be a separate discussion, but would be worth having a session purely on this. It'd be interesting to see how the, how the mortgage works and what is the process of buying one and finding a good deal. All right, so Damien can talk for about two, three, four minutes on that one while I get the other short lease presentation up quickly, right? I don't know if yep. I'm going to manage that, Jay. Two, three or four minutes. <laughs> am I going to be able to manage that? You was going to say wrap no, the question while in chat. Not possible. Right. Oh, one sec. Yeah. <laughs> right. To, to be honest, I'm not really even the guy for auctions, Jay. Like I don't like auctions. But um, anyone who's experienced in auction properties, I know it may be a separate discussion, but it would be worth to have a session purely on this. Do you know what? It's a good shout. We should do one, actually. I might go and speak to Mr. Fam Sam Bongo. Get Sam in here for a mini masterclass. I'm sure he'll enjoy that. Get him to do one for us. Um, it'll be interesting to see how mortgage works and what is the process buying one and finding a good deal. Well, look, I can tell you that. Look, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you my take on auctions, right? Because I have bought a few from auction. It's not that I haven't. And I understand fully how they work. I just don't like them. Um, so look, when it comes to finding deals anywhere, right, it's always going to boil down to the end value. That's what it boils down to. You want to buy a property below market value. So you want to know what is the end value of the property that you're buying? What is it going to be worth once you've done whatever it is that you're going to do to it? Nikki, you wanted to go to the gym. Are you really I've got a lot of work to do. I'm just cracking on. Right, carry on. You keep working. <laughs> but I was going to say, if you've got to go, I could take over if I could. Would it be cool? No, you no, no mate. Sweet. I'll be here for the duration. Um, so it's down to the end value. What's that probably worth when, when you've done whatever you do to it? So when you receive this auction catalogue through, like the first thing is going to be like 100 frigging pages of 100 lots, and there's going to be everything from studio flats to warehouses, right? And you're going to have to go through that whole catalogue and circle the types of properties that you're interested in, one, your property type and your location. And then you're going to whittle that down to about, I don't know, half a dozen. Now, once you've found the half a dozen that you're going to be interested in, you need to now go to the auction to bid on them or bid online, whatever it is that you're going to do. So you're going to work out using your property purchase formula 
formula. If you if you haven't got a property purchase formula, then just log into the member site and Nick's deal sheets in there. My property purchase formula things in there, right? You can you can use that. Um, work out what you're going to pay for it, and that's going to be your bidding amount. But the likelihood is, especially in today's climate, that then properties are going to sell for so much more than what you're hoping on bidding, right? So a lot of the work that you're going to do, uh, uh, in my opinion, is more than likely going to get wasted. Hence why I don't like auctions because your work's going to be like you do with any deal, researching a deal, researching the end value, working out the comparables, downloading and reading the legal pack, really giving the legal pack to your solicitor to assess before you go in there and buy it because if you go in there and let the hammer go down without having a legal representative assess that legal pack for you is, is I think, a recipe for disaster. So now that's going to cost you a couple of hundred pounds a pop. So you've done six of them at 200 pounds a pop. That's 1,200 quid. You might not even win any of them. But once you get to that point, if you're talking about getting a mortgage on it, when you take out a loan, a mortgage, a bridge, and it will be more than likely a bridge when it comes to auction, any loan you take out, that lender, that person borrowing you that money, that company, that entity borrowing you that money, are looking at two things. One, you as an individual, as an applicant, and two, the property. They're loaning to you and to the property. That's why your credit check, your proof of address, your earnings, all that kind of stuff is applicable. But then also they're going to have a survey done on the property to make sure that the security address is more than sufficient for the loan they're giving, right? If you default as an individual, they can reclaim the property and they're not going to be out of pocket. Now, they can check you pre-auction, so they can go to, I'll give you an AIP, I'll give you an agreement in principle. You you stack up, okay, your credit rate is good, you earn X amount of money, you've got 25% of the value that you're looking to buy, cool, but we can't check the property. How do I know what property you're going to buy? Shall we go and get six different surveys done on six different properties? It's long, right? So they're going to wait for you because you don't want to spend that money and then lose every one of them. You're going to have to wait till the hammer goes down before you get that survey done. Now, the problem is, is that once that hammer goes down, you've got four to six weeks to make that deal happen. And in four to six weeks, you've now got instructor broker, fill out the forms, get them signed, get a survey done. You're committed now, by the way. You're in. You're locked in, right? Get a survey done. Is something going to come up that you ain't that you ain't seen? Have you got the money to back it up if the lending don't go through for whatever reason? There's so many um, 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 downsides to it. So in short, to answer your question, which I actually forgot what that wording was right now, um, it will be interesting to see how, how the mortgage works. It's just very difficult, buddy. Like people that go to auctions, I say that you either need to know what you're doing, right? You, you yourself or maybe a JV partner or someone that's helping you, like a mentor and assistant, someone has got like the, the ability around them to, 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 to bail you out if, if, if a worst case scenario happens in the form of you having the, a bail out to you is you having the cash in the bank to back you up if the mortgage don't go through or you being able to go and get the money for a bridge lender at the drop of a hat with in frigging like 24 hours, 48 hours, three weeks, whatever it takes to make it happen. Have you got access, borrowing it from your mum and dad, like have you got access to that kind of money if a worst case scenario was to happen? Because these worst case scenarios could happen. So auctions tend to be for the people that are, are maybe a, a bit more on the bottom. And I'm not saying that you're not, by the way, iPhone, you might well be. Um, but but they're like the risks that, that you want to look out for. You, you're basically buying a property blind, but you're not, having, you're not getting the chance to have a survey done on it or a structural survey. You ready, Jay? Is Jay froze or I froze, Nick? No, I timed you. That, that was like four minutes, 50 seconds. You see? You see, I didn't even <laughs> I was just counting my head as I was talking. <laughs> no, no. Um, I think Claire's asked a question about um, short leases. But um, for what I generally do is look for something with at least 20 to 25% uplift um, in terms of refinancing. Well, not refinancing, but after um, the extended lease and refinance afterwards. So I think the one that she's put in the, the chat, it's a 50K uplift. That's after, but with the lease extended, it's, it's uh, yeah, so 50K. But the thing is, that means you're going to make, what, 20K worth of uplift afterwards, lease to send across the thing. Yeah, that one's not worth it. So the one that she put in the chat, she's buying it for, or oh, it's an open market for 260. Um, with a lease extension, it's going to cost about, or well, the end value will be about 310k. Um, that's 50 grand worth of uplift, but the lease extension itself will cost 30k. That means you're only going to make around 20k profit. So that's that's the way it works, but that particular deal is is not worth it because you're only going to make maybe, looks like less than maybe 10% or so profit. So them kind of deals, that's not worth it, but that's generally how it works in, in general. 
So with my ones, different to Damon's ones, like I look for a good um, 20, 25% uplift. If I can find the slide. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Come down. Come down again. Come down again. Yeah, like for this one, for example, <clears throat> um, a particular example, I purchased it for, I think it was, I think it was 155-ish. I think it was last year, something like that. Um, I put down 25% deposit originally. Um, then when I extended the lease and all that kind of stuff, then you pull out your money at the new value, which would have been about 220,000. Um, uplift in value after you've extended the lease would have been about 52,000 roughly. So with this one, if you wanted to remortgage, it's about 82%-ish of your funds that you've put into it, but you can take out. So, but that one always looked for maybe 20, 25% uplift after you've extended the lease as well. So where's your original figures? Yeah, that one had a 64 year lease on it, 155. Um, this one, one, one from last year. The lease extension cost for this one was 15,466 um, and 90 years on top of what it is now. The ground rent is generally zero, but because the lease extension wasn't too bad in terms of the price, um, the 250 ground rent is, is, is okay really. Doubles every 20 years, but it's not so bad. Cause I'm getting kind of a little deal-ish on the lease extension costs. So like I said, 15K roughly, plus their legals of 1,100 plus VAT, I had to pay for their legals as well and my legals. So everything all in. Um, the end value of this one last year would have been 225, but it's gone up in value at the moment. It's probably worth about 235-ish now. So with this one, uplift was about almost 30%. So if you're going to do a lease extension deal, uh, make sure the end uplift is going to be at least, I don't know, 20 to 25% or above in terms of uplift after you, you've extended the lease. So that's what I look for generally. Or if you're Damien, Damien likes to take all of his cash out of it and then use that to go again. But with me, with my method, is about 70, 70%, 75% left in there. In this case, sorry, not, not, left, not left in there, taken out, should I say. And then that's the way that I do it, generally anyway. So that's in answer to Claire's question in the chat what to look for in terms of, or how much percentage to look for in terms of um, uplift. JD, do you, um, is that a slide from your leasehold um, presentation? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, def guys, that's definitely worth a rewatch. Even mm -hmm. for, the, for those that didn't watch it, you should go and, and watch it. And for those that did watch it, it's definitely worth a rewatch because all of these things, watching them two, three, four times, like I'm sure you can even just play it while you're driving along in the car, like and just listening to the background. You might not be able to see the slides, but just hearing Jay talk. Um, but I would say though, like everybody, the amount and everybody wants to make is going to be different, right? But the general rule of thumb as a bit of a guide for you guys is 20%. Like whatever you're doing, whether it's going to be a lease renewal whether it's going to be a refurb whatever it's going to be um john's put was a brilliant presentation this year it was john jason that excellent on that one thanks for that comment buddy um well whatever your 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 strategy is going to be you want to be looking to make 20 percent because that's what you said for, for for the aggro that i'm going to go through for the money that i'm going to invest for the risk that i'm going to take i'm going to be making 20 percent is that 20 percent going to be on your overall spend or is that 20 percent going to be on the end value like it's generally going to be on your total spend right so purchase price even if if not 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 cash deployed 20 percent on the overall investment right which is the purchase price the stamp the lease renewal cost or the refer whatever all that comes to then factor in 20 percent for yourself as well that's kind of where you want to be so just now when it was 50k on 260 um but then you was going to spend 30 so it was going to be like 290k and you was going to make 20 like jay said you wasn't even at 10 percent that day. it was like seven and a half percent wasn't it yes yeah, low it's quite low yeah i wouldn't bother with that yeah. one 
Yeah, it's, it's not worth it. Like you got to think. Do you know what it boils down to, guys? With these things, even though we don't think like this because we're just straight property investing. But what these things boil down to, when you start talking about ROIs and yields, all this kind of stuff, the reason that people used it, and I never used this stuff, by the way. I never, ever, ever. I don't. I've, I can't. I don't even think on one property that I've bought, I've, <laughs> I've looked at the yield. I honestly don't think I have. Like it, it doesn't. But how this? Where should I put my money? Should it be in property? Should it be in gold? Should it be in Bitcoin? Should it be sitting in the bank, like sitting in the bank used to actually be an option to some people right some people would actually think about leaving their money in the bank and how much they, like if i had a million pound and i stuck it into a, a a bank account at a high interest rate i might get like freaking five six seven percent no no chance of that now um but that's where, where these kind of things come in and that's why people use these 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 markers um to to judge what what they're, they're gonna but for me I, I don't use them but if you're looking to to, to do something on a flip you want to be making like 20 percent really um, but then say that 20% though, Jay, right? When you're doing 20% on a 300 grand flat, you, you bought it for 250, you spend 50 grand on whatever and you make, that's 60 grand, that's nice. But you go, I put 20% on a 50 grand flat, that's like frigging 10 grand. And yeah, it's yeah. the same amount of aggro. Like exactly. you've still got to buy the flat, whether it's in Enfield or whether it's in Doncaster. You've still got to put a new kitchen in, whether it's Enfield. you still got to put a new bathroom in. you still got to redo it. you still got to go through the process, right? And 20% is 20%. But 20% in, in Doncaster or somewhere else, yeah, is 10 grand on like a 50 grand purchase. And 20% in, in somewhere else where the, the value is free is 60 grand. But you're still, you're still taking the same nine months. It's still the same. But obviously there's entry levels. And I understand that, um, that not everybody can afford certain things. But yeah, 20% is, is a bit of a guide for you. Yeah, it's too low. <clears throat> but with your one, that the one you done recently was a triple threat, right? In was it? Is it Kent? I love that. I love, did, you, did you make up that, that <laughs> saying? Triple threat. I love that. Which one was it, Jay? The the one where you refurbed it, changed it from a well, one bed to a two bed. Um, you refurbed it as well, and it had a short lease. So I was like, yeah, I've done a few of them. Threat. Yeah, I've done a few of them. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, definitely done a few of them. Like that's an even more value adds, right? But yeah. um. This is like how lucky are you to find these deals. How hard are you going to work to get these deals? That's the bottom line. Exactly. Well, it's definitely a mystery anyway. So when you see things like cash buyers only, like you said, phone up the agent, see see if um well for the the leases at the moment. If it's above sixty years or fifty five years, then obviously you can get a mortgage on it. If if it's below that, then you got to think outside the box a little bit. But there's still deals to be had, so don't be like put off by when you see things like cash buyers only because there might still be a deal to be had. So, oh yeah, there's another one actually. What's the lowest length of lease you can apply on bridging for? But there's no limit, I don't think. Because bridging is more or less like cash, isn't it, David? No, that there, there will be, there will be like because that what what that what that bridge lender will want to know is is that if they have to exit that deal, it's going to be dependent upon your loan to value. If they have to exit that deal, um, who's going to buy it? So, and this is the beauty of bridging, by the way. Depending on who you get bridging from, if you go to a high street bridge lender, they're going to be a lot more strict with their criteria. It's very much the computer says no. But there's so many private funders out there. I can put you guys in contact with so many private lenders where you're actually speaking to the decision maker and if, if they're a property investor as well and they could mark lloyd's one that you could go to but um he's more of a crowdfund type platform but when you're dealing with these people direct to to to, to, to face and, and they know what they're talking about you can have it well you know what it's a 33 year lease uh, what price you're getting it for they'll do their bit of research oh well you know what i'll give you a 50 percent loan to value at least you know 50 percent there but the, the more risky the deal gets the lower the loan to value is going to be that's what it boils down to guys anyone that's going to borrow you money by default is a lender right and all the interest in these profit and security like how secure they want to do the deal with you they're they're motivated to lend but the deal's just got to be one worth their while and two they've got to be secure and that tends to be interest rate and loan to value they're going to be your two biggest factors Exactly. Yeah, so that limit, I'm not sure about, but it's worth investigating. But for me, I only go for ones that are between 60 and, and 80 years if I'm buying a low lease one. But um, obviously, everyone's different. And the ones in central London, um, owned by the Grosvenor Estate, um, you see sometimes on right move, them ones have got 13 years left on the lease or 20 years left on the lease. But then you, when you apply to extend the lease on them ones, can only extend it by 20 or 25 years on, on top of what it is now. And that's for a hefty six-figure fee as well. So it depends on, obviously, what type of property you're buying and, and the location as well. So that's important. 
right. So, any more questions from anyone? I've got a question. Yeah. When's bedtime? You know my bedtime? <laughs> I was hoping you were going to say that, you know, man. <laughs> You know what? I know Jay's a freaking night owl. I know he's up to about three o'clock in the morning, and I'm a guy that's in bed at half past eight. Like, so I know Jay will just sit here rabbiting. Um, <laughs> Rabbit, you know. You know what, though? I've got to say, Jay, again, do you know what it is with, with your presentations, right? You, you encourage the questions, and the, the not only was the presentation um, great, and I know it would be, was that the questions that then come into it make it even better because we then get to cover more areas and more topics. And if you think about the amount of um, knowledge, I hope we've been able to share with you guys and, and have benefit, not just from us, though, but other people that have chimed up Olivia's story, Rod's input. Um, I think that with the questions being asked, you've just now based basically double the amount of knowledge that that, um, that, that that Jay planned on sharing. And that's made this two hour, two and a half hour. We started at seven. This has made this a two and a half hour special. This has been a, a, a good one. This is one that we need to um, tell whoever missed this, they better log in and watch it because there was quite a lot of, um, we can't say the N word and we can't say the G word. So I'm not sure what word we're going to say, Nick. Um, a lot of knowledge. Pointers, pointers yeah. <laughs> good pointers. Might need your help with bridging, Damien, if the second flat comes together. Yeah, don't worry, Liv, I've got you 100%. Did you know this girl, like, she, it, it, honestly, it, she's on another level. She's early, but this is what happens, guys, right? You don't, what you don't want to do is overload yourself fully, right? But at the same time, like, you have to think outside the box. Like, you, like if you've got, if you have got, if you're being, not necessarily presented with deals, if you're going out there and making deals happen, because that's what this boils down to, you can sit back and wait for deals to land in your lap, or you can go out there and be proactive and make it happen. But when you're going out there and making it happen, you can't, you can't just then say, oh, I've got enough deals, I'm going to leave it there. Push for more. And if you do get to a point where you feel that you're being overloaded, then obviously just knock them out and take, take a commission for them, but look at how much of a pot you've got to play with and then see how you can make that work with taking out a bridge trying to you know work it in such a way where you're, you're going to keep them payments down as low as possible and that would depend on the type of product you're going to take and what loans of value you're going to go for um but definitely try to make more than one deal work at any one time they're not a big deal guys these deals that you're buying unless you're going to go in there and start refurbing them yourself and having to spend every hour of, of, of a working day in there then it, it, that's a different story but if you've structured it differently and yeah live of course definitely on you uh, with you um jason's but yeah that's fine uh-huh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's all. laughs> so yeah, what was that for? Beautiful. That question. Yeah. Oh yeah. So that basically, so going forward, then either one of you guys can do a D, what a BRR one, and a, an auction one as well, as in like masterclass on a Wednesday at some point. Yeah, I, I would feel more comfortable. I mean, I'll, I'll happily do one on auction to just share what I know, like I, mm. I know enough. But I would, I would, I, I think that we should maybe get someone in this, this done a few more of them. So I'll find someone for that for the auctions. I'll happily do a BRR one. Me, me or Ricky could do that. Um, I've got loads of, 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 of ideas of ones that I want to do. It's just finding the time to put them together. You know, Jeremy, mm. how long did it take you to put these slides together? Um, I'll say about a couple of hours, two, three hours. Yeah, I mean, that's because you're probably a team, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, 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 <laughs> No, the hardest um, part was, was you know, the mortgage forms, like the mortgage offers and lease extension and stuff and blah, blah. It's copy and pasting and blocking out the, like, sensitive information and then copy, copying it or pasting it onto the PowerPoint. <laughs> that was the hardest part, <laughs> but the rest of it was all right. Yeah, well, I, I, I do these in my accelerator day. I, I take, like, six, um, live knows, I take, like, six of my properties that I've done and I, and I, and I actually, and do you know what a good thing is about these? I know that's, that's your mate, so you have to take out it, but I leave all my information in there um, because it's mine, so I can, but I know that you, you, you're trying to protect your mate there. But do you know the yeah. good thing about bringing them up, Jay, right, is it, it, it instills belief in people. Not that anybody thinks that you're lying, but the number one factor that people need to go out there and make this happen for themselves is self-belief. So if you can in your sharing, any of you, if you're sharing your knowledge with someone or sharing whatever, if you can really get them to believe in what it is that they've got to do, they've got much a much greater chance of, of, of being successful. And it doesn't mean they think you're lying or they're that full of you, but it's one thing for somebody to say something, especially when there's so many BSs out there. And it's another thing we can actually break it down like that and show them um, the, the facts or whatever else on the figures. And it makes it easier for them to take it in. But um, yeah, I know putting these slides together, Jay, does take a bit of work. But listen, I've got, honestly, I've, I've probably got about, well, I've got a load. I've got a load that, that I want to put together for you guys. But um, whilst I'm getting around to doing that, um, we've got plenty of other fantastic ones, like the one that Jay's just done. And, and we've got some more coming up as well. So cool. Right, Jay, what's your closing words, buddy? 
Um, yep. I think I might take that slow. I think I might take that slow. Has anyone else said that? Where is that on a game show or something? What's your closing words? <laughs> I might take that. I might trademark that. Can I trademark that? Or has someone else said that somewhere? I don't even know. Oh, I'd trademark it. You can try it and see what happens. <laughs> What's your closing word, buddy? If I have the word buddy, that's definitely got to be mine. Mm. Yeah, no, if we're I closing words. Word. And there's no right or wrong area in terms of like vanilla bitelets. Just make sure you do your research on that particular area. And then in general-ish, depending on where you're buying outside London, um, some places are only good for maybe cash flow per month and, and not much capital appreciation. And then, but if you can find a place where you have a mixture of capital appreciation and a bit of cash flow as well, like I said, like, but like, like what Rod said, Birmingham, certain parts of London, maybe certain parts of Kent, then that's a nice double whammy going forward. Um, in some places outside London, it's more about cash flow rather than capital appreciation. But um, yeah, just make sure you research your, your area. Uh, speak to agents, set up alerts on right move and so forth, and then just aim towards financial freedom bit by bit. Those are my final words. Love that. Well done, Jay. Good man. So listen, great presentation from you. Thank you for that. Um, as Jay said, if you, if you want to learn more about the, the low lease stuff and um, the, 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 the purchase up in Bone Castar, um, give Jay a shout. If you want to know more about Mind and Ricky's Accelerator Days and mentoring programs, get in contact with me. Um, join the members panel if you're not in there already. It's £7.99 a month and you get access to more of these masterclasses. Jay, you better get your head on and start thinking about what you're going to do for your third installment, man. You know, no leases <laughs> now. You know, you're five to let. I wonder what you're going to come with, with number right. three. Um, I've got a new strategy after. You've got a, you've got a you? buy to let, you've got short leases, and then you've got a third one. So it's, it's my secret weapon. Are you going to give us a little teaser now? You're going to hold it back. Um, the trailer is going to be released um, in November. The trailer is going to be released. Well, you've actually got a trailer being released. <laughs> he's got it filmed. He's got it edited. It's coming out live, Mr. JP from Enfield. I love that. All right, cool. Right, so, you know, tomorrow at half eight, guys, we've got um Rosita doing um she was she she was going to do a room on the budget, but the budget's come out and there's been very little to be said about the property sector. She's like, damn, what am I going to talk about now? But I've got some questions for her, and it'd be nice to have her in. So we'll see you guys tomorrow at half past eight in the clubhouse room. Jay, thank you, buddy. It's been absolutely yeah. fantastic. All the guys are saying thank you as well. It's been a brilliant prank presentation presentation we expected no less um and we'll try and get the recording uploaded within the next couple of days yeah all right i try and wake up in the morning <laughs> for the room <laughs> what time is it 8 30 8 30 boy that's a bit early you know but i'll try i'll try i'll try i'll try you alone. Yeah. You alone. <laughs> all right see you later take it all right thanks for attending take care thanks jason all right. thank you all right. thanks, jason. Thanks. 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 thank you everyone good night